Um, anyway, welcome back. And now we get to the, um, the glamorous bit, um, where this is the, um, the panel dis the, um, discussion of who has won, who's shortlisted and who's won, um, our ad uh, campaign. And to explain this, we have star of stage screen radio, and he doesn't yet have his own crisp line, uh, Hugh Fernley Whittingstall, along with Sir John Hegarty. So please. Come and explain all. Why don't you stand here? Also, before, also, also before you begin, uh, we're, we're expecting some good puns from you both. because there's, oh, there's a pun oh, no. competition. And so far, John Shropshire's panel is runner-up with 17 puns. And Adam Leyland's is way ahead with 23. So I don't know how you two are going to do. Um, to I'm, totally, to I'm totally, I'm totally, I'm totally unprepped for puns. <laughs> uh, we've been talking more about pumpkins and vegetables <laughs> like that. Is there going to be a ching every time we do one of those? Yeah. <laughs> okay, oh, that's just one gratuitous one to hopefully get the need to pun out of the system. Um, while you have been talking about all kinds of things, and I've been hearing about some of the amazing pledges that are being made here today by big business to basically get more veg into their food, which is terrific, John and I have been working with a, a bunch of amazing kids who are also with us here this afternoon to look at the vital world of how vegetables are promoted. Because we all know that one of the issues, one of the reasons that we have and we do have uh, an obesity crisis in this country is because of the tidal wave of promotions and branding and advertising for the foods that we, do, that we know are not doing us much good. And very little uh, going in the opposite direction. And we need certainly to talk about stemming the tide of advertising for foods that are full of fat, sugar and salt. There is some legislation around that and what times it goes out and what audiences it can reach, but there's a big conversation about making that robust. But I think there's uh, a more important conversation, and frankly it isn't very big at the moment, about positive advertising and messaging around vegetables and healthy eating, especially for kids. So that's been our brief this morning. What we know is that Although we've been hearing about five a day for over a decade now, sales of veg are falling in the UK. 80% of us, it's estimated, are not eating enough <coughs> vegetables. And in terms of the spend on advertising, of all the money spent on advertising food and drink, a mere 1.2% of it is spent on veg. So is it any wonder, with that tide of big brand advertising, that huge amounts of money going into ingenious campaigns using uh, unforgettable cartoon characters and celebrities we love telling us to eat stuff that is not doing us a lot of good, uh, and the counter to that, very little going on to promote veg beyond a few bits of perhaps not very imaginative messaging from government around five a day. So the challenge that was set uh, in preparation for, for today was uh, sponsored by the Drum magazine and supported by London Advertising and also supported very generously by Sir John Hegarty here today. Uh, and he's been working with our kids. The winner has an opportunity to get an advert or at least an advert based on the winning advert out there. When we say out there, we don't exactly know where this is going to land. And one of the things that I want to do today is talk to everybody who's, everybody who's here who could help with that. Because initially, we're thinking in terms of making some unbranded advertising that could be shared among different end users, catering companies, retailers, schools even, we're very open-minded about where it goes. The point right now is just to get that positive messaging out there. We've also been having, over lunch in fact, uh, with John and others from the industry I've just been meeting and brokered by Anna and her excellent network uh, that obviously she's pulled together here today, 
We were talking about a conversation to create an entity uh, that takes on the long-term role of marketing vegetables in a sustainable way over time to bring about the same kind of extraordinary results and transformations that we've seen in things like the anti-smoking campaigning of the past uh, decade or two. And John, I just wonder if you could comment at this point uh, uh, as an expert in this industry. I asked you this question earlier. Is it feasible, is it reasonable, is it important to expect the advertising industry to do a piece of work on this that could make a difference? Well, um, I spent my life working in advertising. So the first thing I'm gonna say is advertising is not evil. It's a tool. It's a tool to be used by people who want to use it. It can be used well, it can be used badly. Um, I spent a career working on things like anti-smoking. That was a very successful campaign that started in the late 60s and the early 70s and created an environment in which the government could increase taxation on cigarettes and weren't seen to be the enemy. I think advertising has a tremendous part to play in the, the role of promoting uh, vegetables and how they can work for society. It does that for all kinds of other brands. As I said, it's a tool. It's there to be used. And I think if you look back at, say, the Milk Marketing Board and the brilliant work the Milk Marketing Board did on promoting milk, you will see that a vegetable equivalent, however you want to call it, you don't necessarily have to call it uh, a marketing board or whatever, but an equivalent could do a tremendous amount for promoting vegetables. And, you know, it's a, in my view, it's a tragedy the Milk Marketing Board no longer exists. That's why milk sales are going down. Ho, ho, isn't that somewhat obvious? You know, stop advertising it, stop promoting it, and all of a sudden, sales will go down. And I would think that the vegetable organization, however you want to construct it, could do something remarkable with vegetables and bring round uh, a sea change in attitude. Uh, and I would be more than happy to kind of help and guide and sort of offer advice on how it should be done. But I think it should be done professionally. I don't think this should be done as a, hey, let's do it as a charity organization. This is too serious. It's a huge issue. Obesity is a major problem. Our health service is, is crumbling under the weight of what's going on. If we could just get, you know, 5% of the population more healthy, how much would that save in health costs? Somebody should work that figure out and with the government and with relevant bodies go, this is why you've got to do it. It's actually a way of making people healthy and save money. So I think it's a tremendous opportunity and it would be great to sort of see it handled professionally. Uh, thank you, John. And on, on that basis and on the conversation I've had with Anna, a conversation starts here today about how an organization like that, what it might look like, how it could be funded. Uh, obviously, one of the issues we have <coughs> is that the world of fruit and vegetables is somewhat lacking uh, in huge uh, brands with a, a, a big spend. I've been, had some brief informal conversations with people who are involved with selling a lot of uh, uh, fruit and veg, and, the, and obviously uh, uh, margins are tight. Numbers may be high, but margins are tight, and it isn't immediately obvious, but one would expect some input perhaps uh, from government. Would, one would expect some input perhaps from retailers. I've explored with one retailer today, the idea of shared unbranding advertising that works across retailers that could be promoting uh, vegetables in all their stores with, with equal weight and they could share some of the burden of that cost. Um, I think we're at a time where ideas like that, uh, that that cut across natural rivalry and competition are no longer instantly rejected as, as being unfeasible, unfeasible or unworkable because everybody working in this industry recognise recognizes that at least some level, at least at some level, there is a common goal here and a common need, which is to get more healthy food to our population and particularly to our kids and to the next generation so that they are not suffering the same burden that we are, but are in fact liberated through a real understanding of what good food looks like and how important fruit and vegetables are to be at the center of that. So that's a conversation we start today, and I hope everybody here who feels they could contribute to it will frankly step up and get involved. Thank you.
Uh, let's get back to the excitement, colour and buzz of the uh, creative work that our kids and John were looking at today. The brief was to various different uh, advertising uh, creative teams, uh, both professional ones and also students and colleges working, and a, a body of about 60 pieces of work was narrowed down ahead of today to 10, uh, which is what John and our children have been looking at. Can we now, yeah, the 10 finalists. I think we're going to have a quick look at them successionally and then they can... Yeah. Mm, Keep them coming. Keep them coming. <laughs> Keep calm and carrot on. You've all got that, haven't you? Yes. <laughs> And those can continue to roll, uh, uh, I think, behind us while I invite up on stage the children, uh, if they're up for it, to, who took part this morning to come and say hello. I've just got a couple of questions for you. Um, maybe come and stand, come up to the stage and, st and, and either sit or stand by the, the smaller mics uh, over here. Well done. <laughs> And if you could just, starting from uh, Anasia on, on my nearest to me now, could you just say your names into the mics, please? Alasia, Felix, Cormac, Micah. So, Alasia, Alasia <laughs> Felix, Cormac and Micah. Um, Alasia, tell me, what were you looking for today? What was important when you were looking at these ads? Um, it has to be truthful, um, memorable and... Motivating. <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. And Cormac. Uh, well, I think a post that will make a, make children like eat more veg will be something that would catch their eye, but when take them a long time to tell like a little glimpse, would get them to know it better and tell their mum like. Oh, can I have some carrots or broccoli? So I think something that's bold and eye-catching. So, yeah. And and Felix, which of these made the uh, best impression on you on your when you were first on looking? On mine, when I first looked at them, it was this one. But when <coughs> I um, got to look at the other ones, I thought about the um, veg and the ve um, ve v power one, but. Um, um, it's going to come on soon, I think. Were, were, there, were there any words, particular words, that seemed to crop up? Power and super. Power and super came up <laughs> yeah. quite a lot. <laughs> and Mika, what about you? What did you like? What impressed you? Well, I think that the really good thing about all the posters was, was they all had a good bit of colour in them and a nice decoration and picture. And which ones do you think were the most impactful, made you really stop and take notice? Well, I think the one that had the four pictures and the um, one with four veg on and it says, like, what to do with and what the veg does with your brain and... Let's find that one. It's an interesting one. This is the one that I read. That was the one Keep I Keep going. The one the Keep time. going. Keep going. Keep going. One more. One more. Oh. One more. Is it gone? Is it in there somewhere? Yeah, what, Keep one going. More. No, one more. It's after this. This, this one. one. That yeah, one. So the tagline here was, uh, did you know veg can give you superpowers? Broccoli, super strength. Beetroot, super smart. Carrots, hitcher. Anyway, you get the idea. Um, and... And one of you suggested that actually maybe there were too many ideas there then they could be broken down into different adverts. Lots of very smart thinking going on. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, will you thank our kids team for the fantastic work they did today. Thank you very much.
Um, John, we've seen some of those shortlisted posters. What were the elements that were working on you? And, and, and I, I think there was a lot of consensus between you and our, our children judges. Uh, what was working on you and making you think, yeah, that could go somewhere? Well, first of all, we, we sort of talked about what does a piece of advertising have to do? Um, first of all, it's got to be memorable, because if it isn't memorable, what's the point? Yeah, you won't have seen it. It's got to be motivating, having got your attention, then you're motivated by the message. Uh, and actually, believe it or not, everybody, advertising to succeed has to be truthful, because you're build a building a relationship with your audience. And the more truthful that uh, relationship is, the more profound it will become. We were actually looking at how could we get um, kids to sort of think about and talk about and consider uh, vegetables, turning them into a kind of uh, a superfood, the superheroes. And those ideas that connected with that were the ones that actually everybody talked about. And if I can just say also, we had a wonderful panel up in Edinburgh who were judging this and another fabulous panel in uh, Cardiff who all kind of contributed to this debate. And, and there was an amazing synergy between the kids and what they were looking for uh, and, and what worked for them when they understood the construct of how a piece of communication works. And I think that what's great about this is there's sort of, you know, there are ways forward here for the kind of this body that's going to be set up. I know it's going to happen uh, for them to actually promote vegetables and promote their their well-being to kids. So um, it, it was really fascinating. I thought, actually, I have to say, a uh, round of applause to the kids again. I thought they were brilliant, absolutely yeah. brilliant. All of them, from Edinburgh and in Cardiff as well. And, and just one thing, uh, by the way, everybody, I'd like to say this to all the parents here. Micah's advice, Micah, remember your advice? Seven times. Once you do it seven times, you'll be doing it. And that was said in the context of if you try any vegetable at least seven times, by the seventh time, you'll really like it. Yeah, you're in so, seventh heaven, aren't you, Micah? So if any of you here <laughs> are only on your fifth attempt with mushrooms, beetroot, broccoli, <laughs> celery, give it a couple more goes. And if you end up liking it, it's all down to Micah. Well done. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's get to the crunch and reveal... Is that counted as a pun? Yeah, I'm going for that. I'm, I'm, I'm happy with that. <laughs> um, it's a shame we're not doing meat today, because I could say, and let's re reveal. <laughs> Very Ooh. bad place to do a veal-based pun. Very bad. I Very shouldn't bad. have even let it out there. Don't go. Don't go there. Um, <clears throat> but uh, let's, get, let's get to <clears throat> the, uh, the reveal. <laughs> the crunch. <laughs> John, will you please tell us uh, who has won because obviously there are uh, creative agencies or creative sources for all of these pieces of work and I think most of them are with us so I hope we're actually going to have a winner on stage but please will you introduce the winning entry it's going to come up on the screen any second and then tell us uh, why we went for this one John. Well um, you've seen all 10 uh, as, as Hugh said shortlisted down from about 60. Uh, the one that we thought was the overwhelming winner was Veggie Power. So I'd like that to come up on screen. There it is. Thanks, Alex. Um, I think there are lots of elements to this that we really, really thought, or well, the kids thought was profound. I mean, one that it would get them to go around the playground playing games, introducing it into their, into their everyday life. Um, it could be, there were a few criticisms of what was on the plate, but that's part of the creative process. You can, you can, you know, you can I thought maybe more than five peas <laughs> yes. uh, in, in, yes. in the improved version. As, as the campaign is, peas, please. Um, more so, peas, please. More peas, please. So, um, uh, but we thought this was very clever, very smart, eye-catching, memorable. Remember what I said? Um, uh, and very persuasive. And actually, uh, based on absolute truth veggie power and establishing that and getting that thought across was very motivating to the kids so those that did do that are they here they are there you go well done
Well done, sir. Thanks very much. Fantastic. Um, Graham, would you like to say a couple of words say uh, a... about this piece of work and what inspired you and where it might go from here? Yes, um, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> totally unprepared. <laughs> Um, actually, it's, uh, when I saw the brief, I loved it. I thought, what a brilliant brief. Um, then I seemed to hate it because I suddenly realised every obvious idea has been done out there in the world. Um, so it was really, really hard. So I spent weeks bashing my brains around, you know, come up with these different variations of ideas. And the main thing I wanted to get across really was, um, yes, lack of peas, but <laughs> to show that vegetables are, you know, not shoving vegetables down, literally down children's faces. It's, it can be part of a meal, introduce it that way. I wanted the children on the poster as well, featuring a veg and then this little bit of a mystery and, and silhouettes behind really to give that illusion of you can achieve whatever you want to achieve by eating vegetables. Well, well, one thing we liked about it was there was just one extra level of cleverness about that power veg thing. You know, the superhero was a shadow in the background. It was just a nice glimpse. It wasn't uh, completely, as you say, in your face. And the children enjoyed that fact that there was a little clue that had to, you, there was a minute where you just have to get it. And that's a little reward in advertising, isn't it? That, that well, that's it. what makes things stick. You know, you, you've, you've as I say that you want the idea to open out inside somebody's head. If an idea opens out inside your head, then you've engaged with it. And that's fundamentally important. And there was a bit of fun there. So, you know, the, the, the next trick is now to do the next three or four posters. I was just going to say, um, one of the things we talked about, Graham, is you've got something good going with carrots there and this sort of shadow idea and a hero in the background. Do you think you can work that theme over a number of different veg, uh, using a similar kind of idea with the kids playing with the veg, creating characters that also somehow represent power and positive images? Can you do it with broccoli, celery? <laughs> I mean, it was part of the brief to try and think about what, what else it might be. So I um, did have various different ideas. Uh, I've got a five-year-old daughter, so having some sort of princess behind um, inspired of vegetables. I did think about Princess Leia with uh, broccoli <laughs> on the side, side of the head. Um, there you go. That, it's that's a usually done with bagels, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> We've moved it on. <laughs> so, yeah, it has, it has got um, some longevity there, and I can, we can push it on as a campaign. Brilliant. Uh, congratulations, Graham. Well done. Thank you very much. Well done, Graham. Thank, Thank you. you. Great stuff. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Um, uh, Thank you all very much. That pretty much wraps it up from us. Uh, we see that entirely as the beginning of a very exciting conversation and some creative work that should be building uh, with a view to what it can achieve, not just this year or next, but in the decades ahead to make kids grow up as excited about vegetables or even ideally more excited about vegetables because they are more important than all other foods uh, than they are about any of the other foods that they eat. And I know there are a lot of people in this room who can help to make that happen. So we look forward to hearing from you and to working with you and thanks for being here today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hugh, and thank you, John. That was very powerful. Um, I really hope that um, something that there's a lot of serious follow-up to that. Because I remember reading a study in the United States, which builds on what Hugh was just saying about the 1.2% the that gets spent on veg, that in the United States, I think the, the comparison is that by January the 6th, the entire budget for healthy food has run out. So, you know, for the next 12 and 9 tenths, 11 and 9 tenths for months, that's the field clear for the junk food people. Anyway, yes, we can make a difference. Well, there are going to be no pledges for the next 45 minutes, but a delve into the realities of changing our diets at home and on the hoof in a culture that makes eating junk easy, but eating real food so hard, as we know by now. The Real Life Veg Challenge. And the panel is chaired by a woman who delved into her own history and did very much research to produce a heartening book, and one that makes you understand that even deeply embedded food habits can be changed. As Micah said, you try them seven times. 
B. Wilson had the same insight. So, B. Wilson is going to chair our panel, who will and introduce the rest of the panel members. Please, B. Thanks so much. So I was just going to introduce the panel first, and then I was going to say my little bit. Um, so I'm delighted to announce we have on our panel talking about the challenges facing children learning how to eat more vegetables. Kathleen Kerridge, who is, among other, many other things, a writer and blogger for The Guardian and other outlets about the serious challenges of trying to eat more veg on a low income and how it isn't quite as easy or quite as cheap as many commentators say. We have Jason O'Rourke, who's a really inspiring head teacher at an amazing primary school called Washingborough in Lincolnshire, who I've been there and they put food at the heart of everything they do, which is so rare to see in any school. And finally, I'm delighted that we have Dr. Rangan Chatterjee, who is a doctor who sees food and health as intimately connected in a way that you would think that every doctor did, but alas, that also is still quite rare. So I'm so happy to be here at this summit and that it's happening. It's really long overdue to have not a conversation about how we eat more veg, but actual practical ways to do it. Weirdly, I feel that for decades, we've been trying to get children to eat veg by telling them they should do it, and we do the same with adults. And then we somehow seem surprised that they don't. Um, I don't know about any of you, but when someone tells me what I should put in my mouth, this deeply intimate thing, I immediately want to do the opposite. UK children universally, nearly, know that they should eat five a day. There was some study from a couple of years back that suggested that 97% of adolescent girls aged 13 to 16 in the UK knew they should eat five a day. But figures from 2013 suggest that just 16% of children in the UK do it. There's this massive gulf between knowledge and behaviour, thought and deed. Um, and the real question is how we get children from this language of should, which is deeply off-putting, into wanting to eat the broccoli, craving the broccoli so much that you actually make it a habit when you grow up and you're controlling who buys the broccoli for yourself. And there's also the assumption that the broccoli is affordable and there, which is the stuff that Kathleen's going to get onto. But you definitely don't get there by lectures. Governments keep trying to fix the obesity crisis with well-intentioned advice. But advice alone never taught a child to eat better. As any parent or teacher in the room will know, you can't just say, I strongly advise you to eat that plate of cabbage and to follow it with a glass of milk and expect that to work. The way you teach a child to eat is through example, enthusiasm, patient exposure to good food, actually seven times may well not be enough, it's more like 14, and also the quantity is crucial, it needs to be as small as a pea or even a grain of rice. Um, that's a huge thing that was some of the research I came across while I was writing my book, Pioneering Techniques. Um, but when all of that patient exposure fails, you lie. In Hungary, children are taught to eat carrots by being told that they bestow the ability to whistle. I'm not really suggesting we do this, but I do think that a little bit of levity or humour would be refreshing compared to this atmosphere of duty that we still bring to vegetables. Talking of lying, I'm not actually a huge fan of the whole hiding vegetables idea that was mentioned from Adam, the editor of The Grocer. When you hide beetroot in a chocolate cake, I mean, it might be a nice thing to do. If you love the flavor of beetroot, sure, go ahead, do it. But what you're teaching the child to do is to love cake and not love beetroot. Um, 
Is beetroot really so terrifying in any case that it needs to be concealed from innocent minds in this way? Everything I learned during the research of my book, First Bite, taught me that the problem of children and veg is about psychology as much as nutrition. Whatever our age, we eat what we like, we like what we know, and many children in the UK simply don't know vegetables or fruit at a really basic sensory level. I know that Jason's going to be talking a lot more about this, but both Jason and I are involved in a very new group who are bringing a system a food education to the UK called Flavour School. It's been pioneered in Scandinavia and France for more than 20 years. And the idea is really very simple. It's just basic sensory education. And a child just might be given the chance that they've never had before to handle different vegetables and talk about how they look and how they smell and how they sound. You wouldn't often even talk to a child about how a vegetable sounds. But you get these amazing comments about the noisiness of celery compared to the silence of avocado. Um, I, we've just been trialling it, but I had these amazing comments when I took tomatoes, whether they're a fruit or a vegetable, I believe that you define a vegetable by how it's used. If you say a tomato is not a vegetable, then red pepper's not a vegetable, and then you go down a slippery slope. But one child, a five-year-old, just said to me, that tomato looks like an ogre's club. And it just felt like it was a bit left field, and, but it was somehow giving him a different way into the vegetables just by talking about how things look, how they feel. Um, and as the class that I've taught so far that really stuck with me, I went into, this isn't veg, it's fruit, but I'm going to get back to veg. I went into a classroom of four and five-year-olds, reception kids, and I brought flat peaches <coughs> in. And we were doing touch, and we felt the fuzziness of the flat peaches in our hands. And one boy said to me, I've never had a real peach before. I've tasted peach-flavoured medicine, though. And this comment just stayed with me because it felt so indicative of our whole food supply. But then I went home and stopped and thought, OK, so we can imagine that children like fruit enough to make fake versions of it. But who makes carrot-flavoured medicine? We can't even imagine that they could love the vegetables enough for that to be some kind of fake synthesized version. We have a massive collective problem with this idea of thinking that children have an innate resistance to vegetables. Yet nothing could be further from the case. All of a child's food preferences are learned. It's also true we have genetic experiences that we bring to bear. Some people are super tasters, which means that Things like cauliflower and kale would taste unbearably bitter at first, but the evidence is that super-tasting children don't eat cauliflower and cabbage any less than the rest of the population because the rest of the population don't really eat it either. But it's offers huge hope. If we've learned our food preferences, we can relearn them, we can unlearn them. And I think we should be talking about adults and children really side by side because Adults were children once too, and if you never acquired those skills in childhood, it's not obvious that you're going to find a mechanism to do so later in life. It's totally possible to become someone who relishes spinach. We're all born with a love of sweetness, a suspicion of bitterness, but there is nothing in human physiology that says we will end up loving marshmallows and hating bok choy. The biggest way a child learns to like veg is through exposure, and this happens even before we're born. I want to get onto the panel, but I just wanted to mention a couple of amazing pieces of research that I came across. There are a couple of biologists in the States called Julie Manella and Gary Beauchamp, and they did a whole series of experiments with pregnant women, and their most famous one involved carrots. They got women in the last trimester of pregnancy to eat a lot of carrots. And then when the babies were born and they were first given their first taste of solid food six months later, Compared to a control cohort, they significantly preferred the taste of carrot-flavoured cereal. I find this amazing. We're being imprinted with all of these flavour memories, positive or not, before we're even born. Um, there was another one involving garlic. I mean, imagine if your mother ate a lot of garlic and you're swimming around in a sea of garlicky amniotic fluid. You're born and already garlic tastes a bit like mother's milk to you, whereas many children haven't been given their chance, that chance. And you could say this, people often say, oh, it's parental responsibility. But what if the parents themselves weren't given that, that chance? There's a whole cycle of 
reinforcing palates for sugary, salty food which doesn't involve vegetables. And when the guy from Mars this morning, it's great they're making these changes, but when he said Mars helps people to eat more healthily, I don't know. <laughs> Let's hope that in the future they will help people to eat more healthily, but I do think the food industry has some responsibility here. But if we want children to love veg, we need to support parents to eat them and love them too. And we also need to change the way we talk about veg. This is my very last bit. The other day, I was just driving home from somewhere with my eight-year-old, and I was thinking about coming here, and it was almost like telepathy. He suddenly started saying to me, I've been thinking about veg. And I said, oh, I've been thinking about veg. And he said, um, why is it that so many of my friends don't like veg? And he said, sometimes the teaching assistants at school talk about broccoli as a threat. They'll say, oh, if you're really good, you could have this and name a sugary treat, or we could give you broccoli in this kind of faux joking kind of way. And then he said, is a pea sinister? Um, and I hope a pea won't be sinister. I hope all of the initiatives that happen today will help children to grow up feeling peas are not sinister. Um, and I'm now going to pass on to Jason, who is helping to make peas very unsinister at Washingborough. Hopefully, hopefully. I think, um, thank you, B. Um, I think this morning's session, very illuminating, and, and a lot was passed on to education. And I was talking to someone at lunchtime and they're saying, well, they will do that. They'll pass all of society's problems onto education. We'll, we'll try and fix them, which we will. Um, we're not shying away from it. Um, but we, have a, a, we can have a big impact on children's uh, habits and how they form those habits because we have children for a long time. And the relationship that we have with children as teachers is a different relationship than the parents have um, with children. Because if you try to get your child to eat a sinister pea or a broccoli. As a parent, it can be quite a struggle. But the relationship that teachers have is different. And the relationship the children have with their peers as well, and let's not take, you know, take into account uh, the peer pressure that happens when uh, children are tasting food in schools, that's a really powerful um, message that can be put across as well. Um, I think what I want to talk about is, is how we have to um, introduce food education to uh, the school. I didn't do it on the fact of childhood obesity or the uptake of, of vegetables. I did it because it was a common thing that children and all adults do. We all eat um, every day, at least three times a day. And if you use it as a teaching tool, it is a really powerful medium. You're teaching children about food and about the origins of food and you can bring it into the curriculum. I think one of the problems we have in an already packed curriculum in all schools is that people see food education as another thing that I have to do on top of all the other things that, that are going on. But how we do it is that we incorporate history into it, we incorporate geography into it. You know, we look at the tomato, where did the tomato come from? South America, how many miles is that away? Let's look at the Aztec culture. Um, we introduce science into it, we introduce the maths. If you're uh, doing uh, recipes then you're upscaling maths, you're writing reviews of things you're using literacy. And the children get it because it's something familiar with them. Um, what we also do at the school is immerse the children in a kind of food-related uh, environment. So the first thing I did when I went there uh, nine years ago is we built a, a children's kitchen. We have a commercial kitchen as well, but we also built a children's kitchen. Um, and so the children have food education lessons every week. Uh, the cheap, the cheap, they don't have to have a kitchen in all schools. Um, an induction hob costs about £50. You can bring that into your classrooms. Um, we also have heritage orchards. So we've got Lincolnshire varieties of apple out there that we use as a teaching tool to get children to understand that there are more than four varieties of apple that you see in supermarkets. There are different ones. And what is the difference between these ones? You know, the texture, as B was talking, with flavour school, and you're using our senses. Um, we have a wood-fired pizza oven, and we got that as a donation. You know, you get builders to come in and be cheeky with them and ask them to build things like that. We have vegetable gardens for every class, and we also have a commercial garden for our, um, our kitchen, our commercial kitchen as well, and beehives as well. Um, we do live in a a rural setting, but that doesn't mean that it can't be done in every setting. There are organisations, things like edible playgrounds, um, where you can be growing things within classes, um, you can grow things in playgrounds that children can then get their hands dirty. And when children get their hands dirty, as, as um, people who have young children, they love getting that done, then they then invest in 
what they are going to grow. Okay, so we get our children to pick, to choose the seeds, to nurture those seeds, to weed them, and then to harvest them. And of course they want to taste that because they've put so much into it. Okay, you've all read The Little Red Hen, it's the same type of concept. And so our children make broad bean hummus and they make carrot hummus. And when we're doing things with carrots, look at carrots in their raw state, a juiced carrot, a grated carrot, a battened carrot, all the same ingredient, no heat has been added, but all tastes different and has a different texture to it. So it's looking at those different ways that you can introduce those, those concepts to children and start very early. As B said about children in the womb, if you get it in with early years children, at the age of three, we have a nursery, they absolutely lap it up. Okay, I had a, a couple of, uh, about a month ago, I took a visit around our school. We popped into the year six class, they were making wood-fired pizzas they made the dough before. They were putting uh, tomatoes that were grown in the garden on the, on, on the pizza, and they put mozzarella on it. And one child who just joined the school had a tiny bit of mozzarella. And I said, oh, you know, Eve, what, how come you haven't... I don't, I don't really like it, I don't want to try it. We all know mozzarella isn't a strong taste. We walked further down, about 40 yards down to the nursery school, and there was a child there who just arrived, a three-year-old, and mud all over their face. I said to the teacher, how, what, how come they've got mud all over the place? Been eating mud outside, okay? Now, we've all done that. We've only done it once, but we've all done that. And that's the difference in those years. Only a matter of six or seven years that a child will put anything into their mouth to try it with the trust of a teacher. I'm not saying the teacher forced them to do it, but with the trust of a teacher <laughs> to do that. And in those, about those years, between three and six or seven, okay, they, with the support of teachers, the exposure to it, and um, introducing it with the, the parents as well and the community and, and the recipes go home with, uh, with parents, they will try things because they have that great relationship with their teachers, they have that peer pressure um, as well, um, and they will try these things. And through the flavour school method, using your senses, taste is the last thing that children do, and you don't have to taste it if you don't want to, but feel it, look at it, hear it, okay? And then, nine times out of the ten, the children will taste it because they're curious about it. Children are naturally curious. So it is, it is a, a concept that you can introduce into an already packed curriculum. One of the pledges I would like to ask, and hopefully the, 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 the grocers are still here, is that at Key Stage 1, we do have the government scheme for fruits and veg, and our children eat that ad infinitum. They don't have anything else. They don't bring crisps in. They don't bring fizzy drinks in. They don't bring anything else in. From the age of seven and upwards, key stage two, it isn't rolled out and the children do bring in things that um, I, I wouldn't see as, as, as healthy as that. So if the grocers are still here, let's get a bit of private sector funding. If you can roll that out to key stage two, you will make a big difference because children will eat those fruit and veg if they're available. so much Jason so now on from education to money with <laughs> Kathleen Kerridge um, the issues I have um, I think most people here would have known them at some point or another uh, you work you work hard you're bringing in the money you pay the rent you pay the gas you pay the electric you pay the bills and there's nothing left and you are then left with your family and your children and possibly 40 pounds in your purse for the week. The challenge then is how do you fill a stomach in the first instance? You know, in absolute basic terms, you need them not to be hungry. So you go for the highest calorie, highest yield stuff that you can buy for the smallest amount of money that you can spend which puts you firmly in the rice and pasta and potatoes category. And then anything else you put with that, it's an added extra, all been there. Vegetables on a very low income are very much an added extra at the moment, and that needs to be addressed and changed because the problem I've got with my children isn't that they won't eat the vegetables, they adore vegetables. They even like Brussels sprouts because they're weird. <laughs> <laughs> they are, they're very weird. You put food in front of them and they will eat it. Mm. Apart from my oldest who possibly has a vegetable allergy, but mm. it's not been diagnosed officially. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, you know, they want this food, 
but I can't provide that food simply because, um, as an example, two sweet potatoes, half a butternut squash, a tin of tomatoes and a bit of paprika. I've got a tagine that will feed six of us with some rice. You know, it's very healthy and it's very full of nutrients, but you don't want that every night. So that's Monday sorted. Tuesday, and it's like, okay, well, we'll have rice with maybe some frozen vegetables that's in the freezer. That's Tuesday sorted. Wednesday, you say, okay, we've got this and rice, and the kids go, oh, I don't want rice. It's like, well, okay, I can do something with pasta. Let's have pasta with a tomato sauce, you know, ten of tomatoes, a few herbs, cook that up. Off you go. By Thursday, I don't want pasta. And it's like, what can I do that I can keep feeding them nutritional food that they will eat, that they won't get bored of? You know, and we're not talking, oh, well, a head of broccoli is only 50p. You know, at the lowest point of my uh, lowest income, when just my husband was working, we only had one wage coming in, we still had to pay the rent. There is this fallacy that if you've only got one wage, you're going to get all of the benefits thrown at your head. That is not the case. You get no help. You get no free prescriptions. You get no free dental care. You don't get free opticians. Nothing is paid for for the adults, and the children do not get free school meals unless you are out of work. So you are in this situation where you're really, really working, and then someone goes, oh, well, broccoli is only 50p, and you go, well, that's great, but my entire budget for each person tonight is 66p a head. You know, I'm not going to spend the extra 50p on the broccoli when you can serve up two sausages and some mashed potato for 66p each. You know, so it's very much... Uh, misinformation from other people who seem to assume a lot of factors are going into the disparity between eating well and income inequality because the parents do want their children to eat healthy. We don't sit there and go, yeah, we're getting them a kebab, it's easier. <laughs> yeah, it's no, no parent I know says that. The parents I know walk around Tesco or Asda and go, yeah, I know it looks nice, love. We can't have that. Come on, move on. 20p value pasta, off we go. You know, and it is the cheapest of the cheap. The nutrition is missing. I mean, my youngest daughter is vegetarian, vegan, which is marvellous. But on the income we were on before I went out to work as well outside of the home, there was no way we could afford to feed her and get the nutrients that she needs as a growing 13-year-old teenager. You know, she's very active. You can't get the fat into them, you can't get the protein into them, you can't get the calcium into them unless you can pay for it. And that has to be addressed at the base level, like courgette. It actually costs 10, pound, uh, 10 times more per kilo than buying a courgette. But the kids want the courgette because it looks good in the packet. It looks fun. It looks exciting. I can't afford that. And if you spiralize it at home, it doesn't taste the same. It, it's not the same food, is it? You know, it's like, oh, that one didn't come out of a packet. It's like cooking a burger indoors or taking them to McDonald's as far as their minds work. So parents are in a situation where the vegetables children will eat and want to eat are a lot more expensive than the wonky vegetables you can pick up from the market that you can afford. And I think that needs to be addressed somehow. Um, oh, thanks so much. That final point about just how difficult it is for people on low incomes to grapple with the whole question of feeding their kids vegetables seems a good moment to move on to Dr. Rangan Chatterjee, who um, in his practice sees a lot of the sharp end of what happens to people and the health consequences when people haven't managed to eat as many vegetables, including with lots of other food that the government might like us to. Rangan. 
Yeah, I think, I mean, I'd, I'd like, love to touch on a couple of those things. I think they're, they're incredibly relevant. Um, you know, as a doctor, I've been seeing patients for over 16 years now. And, you know, when we talk about nutrition, which is something, incidentally, we don't learn much about as doctors, uh, which is pretty remarkable when you consider that, you know, a good 60, 70% of what we're seeing walking through our doors is in some way related to our nutrition and our modern lifestyles. Um, but th 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 there's a lot of debate over nutrition about, you know, is it fat? Is it carbs? You know, what's the culprit? But one thing I love about this concept of um, trying to increase vegetable consumption is it's pretty much in universal agreement that in increasing our vegetable intake is a good thing. I think we've, we'd be pretty hard pressed to find people who would argue against that. So I think that's a really good thing about this to start with is that there's not many naysayers for increasing vegetable intake. You know, I'm a doctor, yes, but I'm also a father. My kids are seven years old and four years old. And, you know, we take health seriously as a family, but what gets incredibly challenging is when they do go to school and let's say, you know, I wish my kids were at your school based on what I've heard so far. Um, but it's, you know, they, they can almost feel like social outcasts if they're trying to be healthy now when around them they're surrounded by, you know, poor food choices. And it really frustrates me because I have this dilemma where I want to do the best thing for my children. And I know the power of nutrition in all kinds of health problems, whether it's things like type 2 diabetes and obesity, or even things like cancer or thyroid problems. It is so widespread what nutrition will help with. But then if all their kids are having sweets at school, if all their kids are having um, biscuits, you know, the things that I regard in 2017, we should, we should regard this as unacceptable at schools, if you ask me. We have one in three kids leaving primary school, overweight or obese. This is a serious problem. You know, just softly, softly tiptoeing around and saying, oh, you know, but if a treat, no, actually, you know what? It's not good enough anymore because um, day in, day out, I, I know in my children's school, every single week, because there's 60 in the year, so 30 in each class, there's a birthday. And that is a license to bring in your treats. And so the whole conditioning around it every week at school, it drives me insane. I have offered my school to come in and do uh, some nutrition classes and all kinds of things. And, you know, they've, uh, again, there's a pressure on them. They feel that they don't have time to fit that in. I'll fit it in if you want, at my school. <laughs> yeah, well, I'd love school. to. I mean, it's, so it, it's, a, it's a significant problem. Um, in my last practice that I worked at for seven years, uh, it was a, in inner city Oldham. It was quite a deprived population in terms of income level and opportunity. Uh, lots of the population were on benefits. And I posted yesterday on my social media channels that I was coming to this uh, summit and I was asking, you know, what role does the food industry play in helping us make better food choices? And, you know, there was a whole you know, myriad of different comments, but a few people were saying, you know, people know what to eat, they're just not doing it. And I really don't think that's the case, actually. And I really would, um, you know, echo a lot of what, what, what you just said. And this is what I found in Oldham. Um, so if I ever forgot to bring my lunch in with me uh, at my practice in Oldham, and I try to go outside and buy a healthy lunch, I'm incredibly motivated to eat well, but I found it very, very hard because, it was about a mile, a mile and a half before I got to a supermarket and I would pass 10, at least 10 chicken kebab or fried chicken and fries shops on the way. And it was something like £1.20. And, you know, this was only like two or three years back for a big family meal. So I could spend 10 or often I would sort of overrun and spend 25, 30 minutes with my patients trying to inspire them how important it was to eat well. But they were walking outside to a health landscape, to a food landscape that just frankly made it very challenging for them to make those decisions. And I think we've got to be aware, depending on where we, where we come from, where we've grown up, um, you know, I'm very lucky. I've always had access to fresh vegetables at home. You know, I'm very lucky that my parents could afford it and I'm in a lucky position where I can provide that for my family. But I've seen actually that is not the case uh, across the board. In the last series of Doctor in the House that I filmed, I remember going and staying with a family, and there was a teenage girl 
who had never, ever in her life, come, she'd never been into um, a grocery shop where there was all these different colorful vegetables there, and I found that remarkable, but, you know, lovely girl, but she'd never come across that. She'd never, ever tried broccoli or kale. So it really, it made me quite sad, actually, to think about it. I thought, wow, what is going on where um, I can live in my little bubble where the kids at my school, uh, sorry, my, my children's school, are being exposed to this and are able to eat this. And, you know, for all my complaints about what happens at school, there's still a lot of them are able to afford and, and have access to that. But there are populations out there where this is not happening. I love what um, Hugh mentioned uh, on stage before and with, um, uh, with, about the advertising. You know, we have to make it attractive to eat vegetables. And as a father, one thing we do, and it's just this fun game we play every night at home around the dinner table, whenever I'm there, <laughs> which won't be tonight. Um, and we've got this rainbow chart on the fridge. And we play it every day without fail. And it's, we all tick off, you know, mum, dad, me, um, me, I am dad, um, <laughs> <laughs> mum, dad, uh, and the two kids. We will tick off how many colours we've had. And it's often, oh, you know, we're missing green now. And so, you know, one of the kids will run out and try and grab something from the fridge. And, you know, I'm not saying that works for everyone, but that's our way. That's my way of trying to make it fun uh, with my kids. So... You know, this is, this is a huge problem. It's a, it's a health catastrophe out there. Okay, this, this is not just a health problem. This is an economic problem. You know, all, all the people from the food industry here, we are getting sicker as a society. These will be the workers. Let's say Tesco, for example, right? The workers at Tesco are going to be getting, like everywhere, they're going to be getting... Um, overweight, obese, they're going to be calling in sick because they're not doing so well, they're going to be taking sick leave. They're, they're, this goes far beyond just an individual health problem. This is a societal problem. We've got America now where the new generation of kids are thought to have a lower life expectancy than the generation before them. I mean, this is, this is staggering and most things that happen in America, we're not that far behind. So that really worries me uh, and I'm seeing it day in, day out and I'm seeing what impacts not only diet and vegetable intake, but our, our modern lifestyles are having on our health. And we're trying to, as doctors, we're trying to medicate our way out of this. And it frankly won't work. The NHS is not coping. And I do not believe it will cope with the burden of lifestyle-driven disease. It doesn't matter which politicians come in, which money comes into the NHS. I think ultimately we need, as a society, to try and take some of this lifestyle-driven disease off the NHS. I think that's incredibly important. And one of my passions is that also as doctors, um, we're not taught about this. I've, you know, literally in the last week managed to get the very first lifestyle medicine course for doctors accredited by the Royal College of GPs. So next year, for the very first time, doctors are going to be able to learn about the power of lifestyle and nutrition. And I'm hoping to teach a thousand doctors next year if possible. And, um, it, it's a small step, but we're going to need the medical profession on board. We're going to need the food industry on board. We're going to need schools on board. We're going to need basically all aspects of society on board if we're going to make a difference. If we think it's someone else's job, we're done. Thank you very much. <laughs> Following on from what you just said about thinking it's someone else's job, that sort of triggered some connections with some of the things Kathleen said about whether maybe people think it's sort of someone else's problem. Mm. And some of the things you said about the sort of assumptions that people make about how easy it might be to buy broccoli on a low income. And I'm sort of coming back to some <laughs> of the things that I know to be true about the psychology of feeding a child, that if you, lots and lots of studies done showing that if you expose a child 14 times, they will probably like that food. In a way, that's kind of an offensive thing to say to someone that can't afford the single head of broccoli because I've also read lots of studies showing that people on low incomes, they're more resistant to new foods because you can't take the risk mm. that your child might reject something. Um, I, I, I do yeah, I do agree with that. It's, I mean, I'm, it's a double-edged sword. I was fortunate in that all of my children had been born and weaned and they were... Uh, well, my youngest was in year one 
when my husband was made redundant and I had a heart attack. It all happened in the same year, which really didn't help. But of course, those habits were already formed. So she had the taste profiles there. She knew the textures. She knew that she liked everything. But then on the flip side of that, I've got a lot of friends now who... As you said, they can't take that risk. You know, you say to them, oh, well, try a sweet potato and butternut squash to Jean. They're like, I'm not going to spend three pounds on that. You, you might know, not they, have they the won't knife eat it. to cut the butternut yeah, squash. Yeah. I mean, I find yeah, it hard enough. Yeah, and uh, cooking facilities. If you're in a bedsit or temporary accommodation, you're very lucky if you've got so much as a microwave. How on earth are you meant to prepare a healthy meal if you've only got a microwave. And this goes beyond families and temporary accommodation. It goes beyond people in bedsits and uh, unemployed men, uh, another demographic who do not get the nutrition that they need because of their life and how they are being made to live. But also when you get up to pensioners in sheltered housing, like my mum, Again, there's no cooking facilities, there's no space for a freezer big enough to store the food and they can't go out every single day to buy it. So across the board, this income kind of inequality, if you will, it is affecting every stage of life from infancy to death and everyone is being affected by that. And to say to someone, Oh, just buy a head of broccoli. Yes, it is very offensive because it's like, well, I know how broccoli works. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I, am, I am aware of what broccoli is. I know how it works. I know how to prepare it and I very much know how to eat it. Being able to afford it is a different matter. And if my children, if I didn't know if they liked it. Mm. If, if you've never been able to afford I, it. I would but... not buy it. I can't risk that 50p going on broccoli when that 50p could go on a bag of new potatoes and actually fill them up. So, you know. So I wanted to bring Jason back in here because yet again, this is where we're going to somehow throw everything back on you. <laughs> I mean, the wizard who somehow, the, the schools are the ones who at that point, if, if families with the best intentions in the world just haven't been able to expose their children to this huge variety of vegetables and fruits, school is at least an opportunity to do that. It is, and, and we have a generation of, of parents who don't have the skills either. Mm. Um, you know, the actual cooking skills, the chopping skills, the preparing skills, the knowledge. Um, and if, uh, you know, my, my job is to invest in the future. You know, it's a uh, big job to deal with what's going on now. But if I can make sure that the children that are in the school at the moment do have that awareness, that food literacy, in want of a better word. And Ranjan talked about... Um, uh, you know, the obesity element that, you know, when children leave primary school is, is one in three are overweight or obese. When they join primary school, it's one in five. Now, if I had maths results like that, then I wouldn't be long in my job. Um, and I think someone else this morning said, what gets measured gets done. We have these figures. The National Child Measurement Programme gives us these figures. If they were then transferred over to Ofsted and Ofsted then used that and we had that as head teachers on our shoulders saying you've got to get something done with this it would have that impact and I think children are so ripe for this they our food education lessons I'm not just saying because I'm here are the most popular lessons we have all, all, all week because they are so engaged with something that's familiar to and new as well and of course you have all of those those sensory things going on and I, I've never taught a child a frontal adverbial and they've beamed with a great you know delight on knowing how to do it but if you get a child to eat a plum for the first time or broccoli for the first mm. time and they realize actually that's something that i wouldn't do and now i do do it that immediate rush that they get from it is proper learning and i think if we can put that into our children and get it within the curriculum and change our curriculum mm. that's not just focused on maths and english all the time it is a broader thing and it does have a massive impact on on children's uh, um, health. You know, you're not going to shorten your lifespan because you don't know how to do multiply fractions or whatever. You are going to shorten your lifespan with 
I think last year, 563 children under the age of 16 acquired type 2 diabetes. And as you said, that's an acquired illness. That's through lifestyle choices. Ten years ago, no children were getting type 2 diabetes. So if we can teach children at primary school, and I'm saying primary school because when they get to secondary, it's WhatsApp and it's Snapchat and it's all that sort of thing. At primary school, they really are, you know, sponges there. And it will get in their head and they will get those skills and feel confident in handling knives, in preparing food, in putting ingredients together, in weighing things out, in using an oven, um, all those things, then it will have a big impact okay. later on. So I have one more quick question for Rangan and then I'm going to open it to questions from the floor. But just how do you have that conversation with a patient who doesn't eat vegetables? What do you say? Yeah, look, it, it can be incredibly difficult and it really depends patient to patient, if, if I'm honest. Um, what I try and do with my patients, and appreciate there's a camera there, so we try and be politically correct with how I say <laughs> this, but I think often we say patients don't do what we want them to do. But I think that's the wrong way of looking at it, and I, I genuinely don't think that's the case. I don't think people want to be unhealthy at all. I really don't. So what I try and do, and this is the approach I take, is I try and figure out why does it matter to that patient in the context of their life? Why should they care? I try and tap into that. And I try and have a consultation with them. So by the end of those 10 minutes or 15 minutes or seven minutes or whatever it might be on that day, I want them to feel inspired at the end of it that they feel, actually, you know what? I can do that. And I think any healthcare professional, and arguably it's probably the same for a teacher, I think the biggest skill is not what do you know up here, it's how do you connect with the person in front of you? So I think the fundamental skill set for any doctor trying to change their patient's behaviors yes. is to connect with them in a way and in a language that means something to them. Don't talk down to them. Make them feel included as part of that conversation. And I generally find, touch wood, that patients want to make those changes. Yeah, they may find it hard, but, but they do and they'll come back and you, you can make a deal with them and say, you know, I'll make you a follow-up consultation in two weeks' time. I'll tell you what, why don't we pick two things you're going to try and do, see how many times you can do that, we'll talk about it in two weeks. You know, uh, and it works. And um, the I'm other thing I just wanted to sort of briefly say was that um, I came back, I, one of the reasons I missed this morning, I was on BBC Breakfast this morning talking about this and why it was so important. And I, I came back and I nipped into my house before I got the train down and my son, who's seven, I said, Daddy, why did you say when, because Dan Walker asked me, he said, you know, it's really hard in supermarkets, um, you know, when you're at the checkouts, you know, sometimes it's all where all the unhealthy things can often be, you know, and um, that's hard. And I sort of echoed that and I said, you know, I find that hard with my kids. And he goes, Daddy, why do you say that? You know, I always make good choices. Um, <laughs> I said, well, yeah, but you do get tempted. He said, well, why don't you just say that, you know, instead of putting minion packets and minion pictures on cereals, why don't they put them on veg? And I thought, Actually, he's quite astute there because he's kind they of. They have tried that. They have done that. Have they done that? And See, you I could argue that. that there's something called the over justification effect. You know, it, it, it's very complicated when you tie up rewards and Fair food. Enough. Could yeah. make you like the cartoon characters more and the fruit less. You kind of want them to like the fruit for its own sake. Could yeah. work though. Worth a try. Again. Worth a try. And the other thing is, I was just briefly going to finish on is just say that I can't imagine that we've ever had a time in our evolutionary history where we've not eaten vegetables. And I think the reason is, and I think, um, you know, there's a lot of animosity towards the food industry about this. And I don't, you know, I think that there's multiple components to this, but I think our children's taste buds have been changed by um, what they're constantly exposed to day in, day out. And I, we, I've been very lucky with my kids because my son got very ill when he was six months old and that forced a big rethink in how we do things. And so my daughter, who's younger, has always grown up with healthy food. So she doesn't really know what junk food tastes like. Okay, that's not me trying to sit on a, um, you know, sit on a high stool and, and, and judge. It's not at all. It's just something we do as a family. I'm going to cut you short because I'm, I'm sure there are lots of questions and I could listen. No problem. Yeah. So I'm just going to open it up to questions from the floor now. There's someone over there. Hello. I used to work in the NHS and I'm now an organic market gardener. Um, I've heard quite a lot about tying together the Department of Health and the Department for Agriculture and Rural Affairs and I'm just, I, I guess I'm conscious that 
quite often GPs will sick and advise people to eat more vegetables and at the same time be writing a prescription for medication. I wonder whether there can't be some more joined up thinking in prescribing vegetables to people who have health problems. Um, I know there's been pilots in the States and I believe there's one happening hopefully in the Netherlands coming up. Does anyone know if anything's happening in the UK and what the results were and if anyone else would like to trial one, I'd love to talk. Um, does anyone want to answer that? Did... I don't know if it's been trialled anywhere, but what I can say, there's a growing movement of doctors in this country um, who are writing out things like a prescription and posting them on social media as a way of just sort of engaging other doctors to do it. So I can't give you stats on how much this is making an impact and how much this is working, but instead of handing out those pill prescriptions, we're writing out, you know, if you will, a lifestyle prescription and putting on specifically what we're asking patients to do. And certainly anecdotally, that is having a very powerful impact because people do sort of expect that prescription when they go to see the doctor. So this is a, an alternative kind of prescription. Um, um, the person with the next That's question right. might actually be able to answer how education and health join up. We have Miles Bremner here who wanted to ask a question. Just on this point directly. Oh. Um, Alexander Rose Charities are about to start piloting a veg prescription programme in Lambeth. Great, that's very good to hear. They're doing it in Brixton now. Uh, what you, you were referring to was the wholesome wave that's going on in the States. They got 100 million from their farm bill last year. They got 29 million this year. And the doctors issue prescriptions that people can go to the farmer's market and get free fruit and veg. Mm. So it's being trialled by the Alexander Road Cross. It's quite advanced in Brixton. Such a good idea. Wow. Um, we have Miles Bremner there with a question. Miles is... Um, from the Jamie Oliver Food Foundation is the author of a really important new report that has just come out this week on the state of food education in Britain. Um, B, thank you. Yes, uh, so the Jamie Oliver Food Foundation published a report into the state of um, food education um, and more importantly, what are some of the conditions or drivers that support children in making healthy choices once they have the knowledge and skills of what it means to um, cook and, and be able to choose healthy food. Um, my question relates to um, the dilemma between the nanny state um, and uh, nudging children to be able to make healthy choices. When I, was <clears throat> when I was director of the school food plan the night before publishing new school food standards, um, our office was rung by number 10 to just check that we weren't banning birthday cake. Um, and the fear... Uh, that um, we've seen also a bit in the news this weekend with sort of um, Jamie Oliver being uh, saying that he wants uh, to stop cake sales or bake sales in schools um, gives rise to that sort of don't take away the opportunity to give children treats. Um, I heard both Rangan and Jason talk about the role of Ofsted or the role of the school environment does the panel think that schools should just be healthy zones? I, I want to say something very quickly, which is the theme I kept coming back to when I was writing my book was just that food is love in so many ways. It's how we express our love for our children. And we somehow believe that love is going to lead us in the right direction. And I include myself in this, and often it doesn't. And sort of using cakes as celebration is part of that. It's really complicated. It's like to say you're not going to have a birthday cake just feels joyless and wrong in the context of a family, but then as Rangan says, you multiply that across mm. 60 children in a year group and you end up with huge amounts of sugar. Kathleen, is this something you've got opinions um, on? Personally, I think that school dinners should be rolled out across the board and the say-so is very controversial. I'm sorry, I think the say-so of parents needs to be taken out of the equation. The healthiest this country has ever been was during World War II when we were all on rationing. The government know what to do. They have their nutritionists. They have a lot of information that us as parents don't always have. As parents, we don't always have the education. As you said, if someone is bringing in a, a cake once or twice a week, your child is getting a lot of sugar. So have the cakes at home. If you Sorry. really want your child to have a packet of crisps every day, Feed them to them at home, but at school, give them the opportunity to have that healthy food. From a low-income perspective, it would 
be amazing if my children could get free school meals and they could get a balanced nutritional meal and I don't have to worry. You know, I don't have to then think, oh God, all that I've got today is two slices of white bread and a bit of jam, you know, and send them in with junk. No, I don't, I don't think the responsibility for feeding a child at school should ever be given to the parents because the whole time one child sees another child eating cake and a can of Coke, they will want it. And it's partly our idea of what's normal, isn't it? Just and take it's, it it's become so normal, but yeah. as with some of the comments people were making early on this morning, you, you go 10 years down yeah, the line I, and that could seem I, so grotesque and strange. Yeah, that we I understand it things. is controversial, but I do think in the long run, if it makes the next generation healthier, all power to Jamie. Get rid of cake, bring in mandatory school I think Jason meals. had... Yeah, I, I, I totally agree, Miles, with the healthy zone option, although I have had my fingers burnt with parents and trying to um, nudge them, as it were, um, into choices for their children um, that they make. Um, but as schools, um, we, we have ways that we can do that, that type of thing. You know, I was trying to get all the children to be bringing water in and, and, and trying water, and all if you go through the children, it works. We provided little bits of lemon, little bits of orange, little bits of lime, that they made fruit cocktails in the lunch hall. Then you didn't see any of these um, drinks coming through. If you talk about the birthday aspect, when I first arrived at my school, we had the kind of cake culture. We just flipped it and we said, what we want the children to bring in is a book. And if you bring a book from home that you've read, you've really loved, bring it in. We'll put a little template in the inside of the book saying from Alice in memory of her seventh birthday. Thank you. And they bring that in and that gets in our library. That gets rid of one of our funding problems that we have. But if you just put it down as a, a head teacher, we're not having cakes anymore. What we're doing is adding to the children's education by bringing in books. So we don't have cakes any Birthday books, that's that. brilliant. I know yeah. that I, I want to come to Ranga, but we have one, at least one more question and we're running out of time. Just to talk quickly about examples where school programmes have actually had, we think they've had some impact. I'm involved in a programme in Amsterdam from the City Council and they're, they're seeing a slowing of childhood obesity and potentially even reversal in some areas. And one of the major factors there appears to be what they've done in schools. And not in all schools, but most schools now only allow fruit, vegetables, no sweet things. And they also have a very interesting gardening programme where every child in Amsterdam, when they're nine or ten, gets to spend a year gardening. Mm -hmm. And we're also about to pilot a prescription, vegetable prescription programme, if anyone wants to know about that. Um, that's brilliant. I wish there was time for more. I'm sure you will join me in thanking our fantastic panel, Rangan Chatterjee, Jason O'Rourke, Catherine Perrin. Thank you. Actually, that could have made an entire conference. Um, and I'm sorry to move on. Um, one of the things we wanted to mention is a pledge we've had from Cardiff. Um, the pub chain Brains um, and also Castle Howe. How? I don't actually... Anna, what, what is Castle Howe? A wholesaler who supplies the pub chain. Okay, so that's what's happening in Wales. Um, our next panel is concentrating, ah, it's up there, you see, the problem with this is you can't see what you're doing. Um, so our next panel, which is about further commitments, concentrates on eating out, which is something more and more of us do as we cook less and less frequently. And the pledges made by the companies in this sector. Um, the chair of this next session is Andrew Stephen, uh, CEO of the Sustainable Restaurant Association, an organization that I was skeptical in its early days of it ever having, taking off, but it really has taken off. And in, in closing within it, um, the Michelin-starred chefs, but also the big food chains. 
And it's an organization that's working across every part of the eating out sector to get serious about sustainability in its proper meaning, turning out meals, employing people properly, managing waste in a way that doesn't undermine the planet and those of us who live on it. And the panelists here represent some of the of the sector's biggest players, but I will let Andrew Stephen introduce them to you. Andrew. Hey everyone. Is anyone um, quinoa on a few more puns, or have we had enough of that? Uh, I don't know about you, but I, I was getting a bit gored of uh, all the pun chicory. Uh, you know, the same ones, okra and okra again. Uh, it's it's uh, enough to make you artichoke. Um, if you are still squashed at the back, there's plenty of legume down the front here. Uh, and yeah. as Sheila kindly mentioned, I'm Andrew from the SRA, which stands for something really awesome, as one of my colleagues told me today. And we love a bit of veg. Uh, the, the reason we love a bit of veg is that it solves a lot of the things we care about all at the same time. Um, we work with all kinds of food service businesses about uh, their impacts on people and planet. And when you sort of try and think about the kind of biological systems that sit at either end of our quite big, complex industrial food system, you've got two bits of biology. You've got a piece of soil and a human stomach. Uh, and when you're looking at what's healthy for one, uh, it's often what's healthy for the other. And it's not actually too complicated. The Venn diagram of that is just a big wobbly circle called vegetables. So we couldn't be happier to be here today uh, uh, with some fantastic panelists who are going to be talking about how they're going against the grain and, and doing a bit more than others on um, uh, serving more veg. So we've got uh, Lisa Brigham from Greg's, <laughs> Mike Hansen from Baxter Story, uh, Bridget Jackson from PwC, David Jones from Bidfood, and David Mulcahy from... Sodexo uh, and Sarah from the Healthy Eating Company. So if you all sort of <coughs> metaphorically get your dinner jackets on, we're off out for food. Uh, <laughs> I promise I'll uh, leave you guys time for some questions if you can think of some good ones. Because uh, this is really important. It's what we eat out at lunchtime and at dinner. It's what our kids are eating at school. It's what we eat when we go to hospital. Um, and there's some really fantastic innovation going on here. So I was asked to talk for a couple of minutes about the challenge. Uh, and I guess as we sort of probably those of us who have been here all day kind of get it by now that you know we're trying to make it easier for people to eat veg everywhere uh, and what we're going to be talking about for about the next hour is um, how we get people to eat more veg out because we're not right now uh, I think the, the stat that the Food Foundation put up was that we're eating something like uh, yeah every three meals out gives us half a portion of vegetables um, so it's really important that we kind of come together and think about how we shift that you know, why it matters is that we're eating out more and more than ever before. It's no longer just a treat. Um, you know, the food industry in terms of the eating out and hospitality sector has been absolutely brilliant in the last 10 years at offering convenience, taste, freshness, newness. And it's grown substantially off, I guess, serving people what they want. Uh, it's grabbing more and more of people's food spend uh, and frequency at which we're eating out has grown a lot too. There was an ONS study earlier this year that sort of tracked household spend. And they said for the first time, less than 12 pounds a week per household uh, is going on alcohol, tobacco, and narcotics. I don't know how they get people to be honest about this sort of thing. <laughs> and, and 45 pounds is going to restaurants. So, you know, what was once a smoke-filled house party is now a picture of an avocado on Instagram. And um, <laughs> we're pretty pleased about that. So it, it's beyond just the calories and the fiber or lack of it on the plate about why what we eat out matters. Uh, because eating out and what we eat out has such a huge capability to influence our food tastes and our food trends, as we see again and again. So uh, it's for those two key reasons that we think that you know, more veg out uh, has got a long way to go. I think the challenge cuts both ways, and um, I'm sure we'll hear a bit more of this from our panel. Um, you know, the, the boom in the sector over the last 10 years has left a landscape of fierce competition. The kind of battle for lunch has never been fiercer food service businesses in the grab and go market and you know your workplace caterer are trying to grab your attention in a smaller and smaller window uh, there are some tough economic circumstances around growing food prices skills and labor shortages um, so it really means as well as putting more veg on the menu uh, businesses trying to do this have got to bring their customers with them 
and changing the veg you serve out is a lot more than just changing just the menu. So I guess um, without further ado, we'll sort of kick over to the panel and uh, hear a little bit more about the pledges and commitments that they're making. And um, Lisa, would you be kind enough to start us off? Hi everyone, yeah. So um, Lisa from Greg's. Um, we've been working closely with the Food Foundation for a while now and it's great to be here and be part of the Peace Please initiative. Um, I think one of the key things about Greg's is the scale in which we operate. Um, we have 1,800 stores across the UK and over 6 million customers visiting our shops every week. So, you know, any changes that we do make, especially on a positive note, have scale to have huge impact um, on public health in particular. Uh, customer health is a key focus for us. Um, we've been committed to encouraging healthier food on the go choices for a while now. Um, some people aren't aware that we actually do have a balanced choice range which was launched in 2014 and it now actually accounts for 10% of our sales and that's sort of lower calorie, healthy food, your salads, your wraps, um, so, so that is a bit of a step change for us and our customers and you know that continues to grow in popularity. Um, you know, the, there's no beating around the bush. Customers love our sausage rolls. You know, we, we don't shy away from that. I think what, what is important to us is that we can offer our customers choice um, and healthier options when shopping with us. And while we do offer veg in products across the menu, so, you know, you do have your cheese and onion bake, naturally some of our products lend themselves more easily to up the, the veg intake. Um, so we decided to focus with our pledge on products where we could make a real difference. Um, we have soups and leaf-based salads as part of our balanced choice range. So we decided to look at those and also our cold sandwiches, um, which are up there with our best sellers and you know that would really help make a big impact. Um, so our pledge is to make sure that all of our leaf-based salads and soups um, I mean, we're almost there, to be honest, with providing at least one portion of veg, but from January next year, all of those will contain at least one portion of veg, and half of our cold sandwich range will contain at least 50% veg. And I think above and beyond that, what's really important is that at the forefront of all our new product developments, we have new products coming out all of the time, is that veg is kept at the forefront of the mind and you know healthier options continue to grow and, and give our customers more choice. Great, thanks very much Lisa. Um, Mike, perhaps you could kick us off by talking a bit about Baxter Story and the work you're doing with PwC. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Um, for those of you who don't know Baxter Story, we're a food service uh, provider for catering in the workplace. Um, and uh, we're absolutely thrilled to have partnered um, with one of our major clients, PwC. Uh, on this on this initiative and our pledge. Um, Bridget's going to just touch on, on our pledge itself and what we're going to talk about, and then I'll, I'll, if you come back to me, I'll talk about a bit more about what that means to back the story. Great, thanks. So PwC is a professional services firm. We've got about 18,000 people in 30 offices across the UK and then a much bigger network around the world. And uh, it's probably worth just touching on why we're interested in this. And there's three main reasons. The first one is obviously we want healthy workers because well-being is about them being happy and motivated and productive. Uh, the second one is that actually some very recent research that Baxter Story have conducted in our business shows that a lot of our people want more vegan and vegetarian options and it is on trend. So I think you found that 20% of people were asking for more vegan and vegetarian uh, offerings and uh, alternatives within the restaurant. Uh, and the third one is to do with sustainability, so environmental sustainability, which really goes to our values. We've had a very progressive sustainability agenda for a long time, um, and uh, with the carbon and water footprint in many of the regular meals that get served today being so much higher than vegetable-based meals, we feel it's really important for us to also address the climate issues and the water issues with this program. So um, we were absolutely and delighted about this program, and it's the only pun I'm going to give, but we felt that it was a kale to action for uh, the thing that we had wanted to do for a very long time. Uh, it's not rocket science. Uh, it is a whole load of very pragmatic uh, options and uh, initiatives for us to put in place. But in short, across the UK, there are six offices that are big enough to have in-house catering. So some of them are in London. We've got one next door, which has got 6,000 people in it. And then um, Birmingham, Belfast, East Midlands, and a couple of other London ones. And so the pledge that we have jointly developed is that we will increase our spend 
on fruit and veg as a proportion of all the food that is prepared for our people from a baseline of 16%, which overweights, by the way, for, versus the UK, but nevertheless is not high enough. And so we've set ourselves a stretch target by the end of next year to reach the 20% that the Food Foundation set as a challenge. So we've dispensed with all of the interim targets that you might set, and we've just said we're going to go for it because aspirational targets, which have got deadlines and numbers associated with them, have stood us in really good stead in the past. And to give you an example on a related topic, we set ourselves back in 20, 2007, I think it was, a goal to go zero to landfill on food waste in 2012, which we achieved and have maintained since then. We then set ourselves an aspirational target to go 100% reuse and recycling by June this year. We've got close, it includes sending food waste to anaerobic digestion and to composting across the UK. And frankly, the only problem we've got is composite food packaging, for which we don't have a better solution than incineration with energy capture off the end of it. But we are delighted now, having done all of that, to focus on the food that we get to our people. Uh, and together with Baxter Story, I've come up with a whole load of things we're going to try and innovate across business. So I'll let Mike talk to that. Thanks, Bridget. Um, I mean, we have, uh, Baxter Story and PwC have an amazing um, degree of shared value, particularly in the sustainability space. Um, and this pledge is absolutely in line with our own ambitions to promote healthier and more sustainable lifestyles, not only for our own people, but also for our customers. Um, we're a relatively, although we're, num we're around number three in terms of the size of food service operators in the UK, um, we're actually a quite a, a relatively small independent business. Um, and we, we feed around 600,000 people a day, which sounds like an awful lot, which is what is fantastic is we have access to all of those people. And we have access to all those people to promote um, vegetables and fruit, increasing fruit and vegetables and a more healthy, sustainable lifestyle through the food they eat um, in the workplace. But hopefully that will, that will also, we have the opportunity to help educate uh, and take that message home with them. Um, some of the things we're doing with, with PwC to actually make this pledge possible um, is we'll be running some, um, some promotions, um, a veg hero dishes on a monthly basis. For example, today, um, across the, all those, those uh, six buildings that Bridget mentioned, we've got a, a Thai um, pumpkin curry with almonds. Um, and that is available everywhere. And it's with the hashtag, please, please. Uh, and it's promoted in, in, in line with our pledge. Um, and that comes alongside uh, information, um, a game, um, to, to uh, promote the idea of uh, the impact of carbon and how um, different meal choices have different carbon intensities. But also um, uh, comes up with a, a recipe card and instructions on how to actually make the dish. So the customers can actually take those home. And our plan is throughout, as we progress throughout with our pledge um, over the months and years ahead, will actually be pr producing recipe cards alongside each of those veg hero dishes so our customers can take those away. And one thing we're really excited about, one is our partnership with PwC, but the opportunity going forward with our other clients as well um, throughout the UK. Um, and I'm, af I'm afraid to say we're actually using uh, PwC as a bit of a, a, a test bed for this, um, but what that, what we've been allowed to do that because of our, our shared values. So we're very excited about the pledge and are very excited about where this is going to go. Great, thanks, Mike. And I know Baxter Story have recently started working with the Scottish Climate Change Research Yes, Center, indeed. So yep. I think they'd be up for it as well. I look forward to seeing what happens there. Um, David, uh, tell us about what's going on at Bid Food and your. So, uh, Bid Food are a nationwide wholesaler of uh, frozen ambient foods. And um, I think it's important to say, first of all, it's great to be here. Um, and let's thank the, let us thank the team at Food Foundation, <laughs> thank you, uh, for the invitation. Um, I'd like to open and really make direct reference to the fact that Bid Food want to help stimulate the conversation that frozen and ambient vegetables really have an important role to play alongside fresh produce. Um, the benefits are well known in terms of locking in essential nutrients. George Eustace touched on this earlier, as did our colleagues at Birdseye. Um, frozen food alternatives really do iron out the seasonal challenges and with any finite resource reducing waste is a benefit that should never ever be underestimated. But today is our opportunity to focus on increasing sales for the right reason in food service and specifically for bid food phase one it's with our workforce. We have all been very busy recently exploring food and now it's an opportunity to refocus on the segmentation a third of all fruit and vegetables should be consumed every day, as per the Eat Well Guide. 
but I'm optimistic that the next generation are healthy food explorers. Schools teach at an early age the benefits of eating well and getting exercise. And references of the Change for Life programme aren't uncommon, and they haven't been mentioned today, and I think it's important we do mention this progress. Interest is growing in vegetables after decades of decline. Retailers are, in, are innovating. Sexy veg, we heard it here today. I think that's fantastic. And <coughs> food service are renowned to be fast followers. So really, now is the time to raise the awareness and the vegetable steaks at bid food, and we'll play our role. So our pledges. We will want to feed the 5,000 colleagues two portions of veg every day in our workplace. We want our 65,000 business customers to include more veg on their menus, and we'll encourage them to do so with recipe suggestions and high-level marketing activity. We rooted around for some ideas, and working with our catering partners, such as Baxter Story, actually, we are already offering greater vegetable options within our um, distribution hubs. And each of our distribution hubs has a sustainability coordinator who will lead the initiative. So the call to action has already been issued. Growing competitions, be it on a windowsill or even in the actual small areas we have alongside our distribution hubs, all raise awareness and connecting the teams with vegetables, which have already heard how important that is. So we're asking our teams or even our drivers to go veggie for a day. And I think that's going to be a big discussion point. From a customer perspective, recipes, recipes, uh. <laughs> 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 recipes, as they will be known, will focus on the hidden veg element. And I know that's caused some discussion today, but again, it's another tool in the armory. And the lemon sponge with hidden parsnip is already something that's live. We have some challenges with ambient, stable and vending machine options, but this is just the start of our vegetable pledge. We won't beat around the bush at bid food. <laughs> Great, thank you very much, David. Um, and I'd like to pass to David number two uh, from Sodexo to talk sort of a bit about what you're doing. Now. <coughs> thank you. I think we're all out of puns, are we? <laughs> but uh, I'm glad to turn up. My role in Sodexo is uh, primarily as a chef, uh, and so a lot of what was being spoken about uh, this afternoon and, and on this panel obviously. Uh, rings true and makes you feel very passionate about uh, wanting to do more uh, and I think each speaker you feel like you want to run up to them and say yes we're, we're going to be part of that because it's very it's very passionate so my role in terms of training and developing chefs and uh, in taking the food uh, piece and developing menus and recipes across all of our business is is what I do and what I'm passionate about so when we were asked to be part of of this pledge and, and, uh, and we spoke internally about it, it was a case of what could we find to do that would, uh, one uh, to one of the advert uh, pieces there, be truthful and be honest about what we could achieve. Uh, and then we could measure ourselves on, at least then we could begin to talk about that. Um, and as such a big company, uh, we have to, we're involved in every sector and uh, we have responsibilities across uh, from schools to, to seniors and everything in between. Uh, and as uh, Andrew said, you know, that the squeezed workplace and, uh, and work times makes it uh, uh, more challenging, but also more exciting to try and uh, be uh, on trend and unique. And so when you put the vegetable piece into this, um, the idea of then raising the bar and encouraging people to, one, eat more veg, but from my point of view, encouraging our chefs to be more enthusiastic and excited about preparing more veg and actually exploring their skills and maybe sometimes rediscovering or discovering their passions is something that we've got to, to push. And that would be, for me, something exciting to get, to get behind uh, and to, to remind ourselves of, of what's important. So from our pledge point of view, from a Sodexo perspective, we, we have a, a corporate responsibility strategy, which is around a better tomorrow uh, plan. And that, that talks about and, and deals with our uh, commitments and responsibilities to our employees, uh, to our uh, suppliers and clients and customers, uh, and then as a corporate <coughs> citizen. So a lot of what's been spoken about today just rings through at every, at every part of that. Um, and so this, this fits neatly. And we're not starting from a, from a stop point. You know, this is something that uh, we've been, like many people, just concerned about and interested in for, for many years. 
And for the last few years, we've been working with uh, the WWF around uh, uh, dealing with that, and we've launched an initiative known as uh, Green and Lean, where we've taken a number of recipes within menus uh, and moved the proportion of vegetables to two-thirds of the plate being a vegetable plate. And that, that is a shift, and it's a shift uh, you know, for people from a cultural point of view, from a habit point of view, etc. But in, in, in some environments, we can educate and do that more easily, um, particularly schools, uh, where we can at least guide uh, our people to eat more healthy. So our commitment essentially is we looked at the amount of vegetables we buy, uh, stripping out potatoes and fruit and everything else. And we, we, we looked at that and thought, right, currently we are purchasing uh, in excess of 3.6 million kilos a year of vegetables. So our commitment will be to raise that, uh, to add 10% to that, to take it to 4 million uh, kilos of vegetables uh, within uh, the two-year period up to 2020. On top of that, and to support it, we need to make sure that we promote. And uh, uh, because I, I, you know, I personally think the more we get behind something like this, turn it into an initiative that's really um, exciting, that more and more benefits will come from it. So more people will get excited, we'll come up with new ideas, new promotions, competitions, all of the things that you just mentioned as well. Um, and that will generate more and more interest. So the basic commitment is the 10% increase, but also then to support it by uh, uh, when we are building new menus and recipes, that we bear that in mind and we constantly add vegetable content in an exciting way as well to to recipes, and also then promote that through internal promotions, promotional calendars, which we do, but again, we're going to focus more and more on, uh, on the vegetable uh, content. Uh, and just as I said, with the Green and Lean program, also <coughs> mainstream that and develop that even further. So that's where we see ourselves being able to make a difference. Great, fabulous. Thanks, David. Sorry for calling you David number two, though. It was <laughs> flattering. Um, actually Head of Culinary Development and Craft Strategy, which is a pretty cool job title. So you're not David number two. Um, and last but not, not least, we've got Sarah from the Healthy Food Company. Hello, good afternoon. Um, apologies, Kay Shearing founder, can't be here today, um, but I'm very pleased to be here. <laughs> <laughs> our veg pledge is we have designed our dishes to ensure two portions of vegetables are served in as many dishes as possible. Our dishes will be tested against all acceptable software as an ongoing monitoring process. All new MPD will involve increasing the vegetable content of our meals in line with our pledge. We work very closely in the education sector and we recently launched in the NHS. And the biggest thing that we have discovered talking to various people is food is a form of medicine and getting the right nutrition into patients whilst in hospital is a real key in aiding recovery. We have worked really for the last six years already developing a range of 24 dishes and one key thing that we do is we do put vegetables in our dishes. Initially, our younger range um, are hidden vegetables, um, but as you know, we go for the older ages, five plus, the vegetables are visual in the dish. And I think even though we talk about school age, I really do think that there should be more stricter controls in nurseries as well from a much younger age. You know, because some children are in nursery on a full day, so they will have their breakfast, lunch and dinner. And I think if we can imp implement things at a very young age, their taste buds, you know, textures, taste buds, you know, the visual, and encouraging them to get involved, um, I think will make such a difference and hopefully make the job a little bit easier when the children go on to sort of primary school um, and sort of educating them from a young age. I think it's a lot of education that needs to be done with parents, um, and, but not just educating, supporting as well. And I think sort of the vegetable prescription is actually a fantastic idea for some families. We focus also a lot on obesity in children, but we have as many children in this country malnourished. And it's not because they come from a poverty background, it's because parents have the lack of knowledge about nutrition and really what children should be eating. And again, this is why I think education is a key. 
Great. Thank you very much, Sarah. So, great set of pledges there and commitments. <coughs> Thank you all. Um, I guess to try and sort of wrap them all uh, up and, uh, and sort of summarise what that means is we've got businesses at scale that are looking to put two portions of veg at lunch uh, for their staff and their customers. We've got quick service and food to go that are looking to increase the veg in a significant proportion of uh, what you grab and go very quickly as you're running between meetings. Um, and we've got businesses that are looking to put two portions of veg on every kid's plate. And, you know, none of those things are easy to do. I, I know we had the comment before about in incremental change. And I guess when you look at a slide that has a sort of percentage to another small percentage, it, it can feel a bit incremental. But the amount of work to get that to happen in the business is at the scale we're talking about here is quite a lot of change in, in the real world. Um, in our own little way, the SRA um, tried just to help that along a bit faster. So uh, we're behind all three of those pledges. Uh, we, we campaigned this year on kids vegging out. We had over 3,000 restaurants put two veg on the menu. You know, there's a lot of waste in this uh, sector. And one of the things we can really attack is everyone trying to become an expert in all this stuff. So I've got a bag full of these, which are kind of handy toolkits about how to put two veg on every kid's plate without scraping it into your food waste bin uh, 45 minutes later. Come grab me at the end if you want one of those. We spent a long while writing it. Um, so I guess uh, I promise you some time for questions. I, I, I'll try and just sort of quickly um, capture a couple um, before we kick off. I guess what always um, we find challenging is, you know, in, in eating out, you've got such a diverse sector and you've got a really diverse customer base and lots of different customer experiences. Some of you are feeding people every day. Some of you are sort of hoping to stop people for a couple of minutes while they're running down the high street. Um, so. I guess a question to all of you, like in, in sort of sitting down and thinking about this commitment, um, where do you think your customers are on this issue? Do you feel like you're adopting a kind of leadership position over your customer? Uh, or are you kind of playing catch up with a trend you're seeing and, and really catering to a demand uh, that you're being asked for? Uh, David. If I could, I think it does depend on the customer demographic. I know within bid food, we um, serve from cost sector to fine dining. But by carrying out this activity, we have an opportunity really to create that headspace across all of those customers who are at different points in their journey. So from a, from a bid food perspective, this phase one will actually hopefully just raise those stakes and awareness. And, and that will have different levels of penetration depending on the customer sector within, within, within my world. Please. This year, um, we launched with Park Dean Results, and you know, as we know, children do like a burger, they do like chicken nuggets, but we partnered with them um, so that on their menu they had the option of a healthier ver version. So, you know, parents had that option to choose a healthier meal for their child. So, for example, our cottage pie. You know, we say our service ingestions is that is two portions of vegetables. It's about you know making them slight changes um, in the industry. You know, children should have the option to have healthy food. So, more leading than responding to yeah. customer demand. You think? Yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks. I think similar to in, in our environment, it depends on the sector we're working in. So. If we're in uh, education, you know, it's going to be looking at uh, developing menus that are interesting, exciting, etc. And often more and more now linking also to the school itself and the curriculum. So there seems to be more conversation, at least, going on around around that. And one of the things that um, you know that we do as well, which is is a slight aside, but from a from a support point of view. Uh, we sponsor Future Chef, which again a number of companies do. And actually, if you look at how an initiative can get into schools and into kids, uh, you know, in this case between 12 and 16, uh, and encourage them to cook. And uh, to give you an idea, 17 years ago when it started, there was 200 kids involved. This year, 10,000 kids involved. It's a massive in initiative um, where the teacher that was here earlier, you know, and you think of all of that good practice, if you could join all of that up, we as an industry would get behind that and support that. And you kind of think there should be more of a common thread between what is being taught and what we can offer and how we can join those two pieces together. So it does depend on our market, and that example is very much around kids, but it's also around the fact that we as chefs and we working in various companies have got skills and we can, we can 
teach people and help and mentor and guide people. So we can we can play that as well. I, I think there's obviously you know there's a, there's a huge scope for improvement, but I think it's important that we acknowledge that um, public sector food procurement standards have increased dramatically um, in the last five to ten years from where they were. There has been so much focus. Um, the Jamie Oliver example is a great one in terms of how actually the food offering in schools has a step change from um, it, where it was five ten years ago. I do agree there is huge focus and we've got to work on those connections, but it's important to acknowledge that there has been significant improvements. And I think that's important for the audience uh, to be aware of as well. I think um, in, a, in the business and industry um, sector, so that's catering in the workplace, such as we do for PwC and, and, and other clients, and, and as David does in, in many of their clients, um, I, we, I mean, we've been, we've been involved with um, Form for the Future on the plant protein uh, on the Protein Challenge 2040 for a couple of years now, um, looking to normalise not only um, increases in, in, in vegetables, but also from a plant protein point of view. <coughs> and I think the, the messaging is the same in terms of the way we actually need to go about this. It's about just um, rather than wagging the finger at customers or telling them what, what they should be doing or trying to make them feel guilty about the fact that they're, they're not eating more vegetables, is making... Is making um, and this is going back to your point um, about leading, is actually making some amazing food that is either plant protein based or it's just vegetable based, um, but it is amazing food. So it gives people the, the, the desire to eat that food and, oh, and by the way, it's not meat or it actually it is more vegetables. Um, and I, th I think there's a, there's a theme that's gone round uh, almost in every panel today around education and awareness. Um, and that's not just about what number of portions of vegetables we should be eating, but actually it's about what you can do with vegetables to make them amazing. Um, and the opportunities that there are, I think there's a bit of a, um, uh, vegetables have a bit of a, a bad rap. Um, sorry, that's a sandwich pun, not a, uh, not a vegetable pun. Um, but it's, uh, it's um, uh, for being boring. Uh, and I think that maybe that's, that's some, of, some of the part of what, how I kids um, wouldn't like them. I mean, um, my kids are not great vegetable fans, certainly my nine-year-old. Um, she thinks the tomatoes come in a bottle, um, but unfortunately they don't. Um, but I think it's about learning about what they can do with it and making some amazing dishes. I mentioned the, the, uh, the Thai pumpkin curry um, with coconut and coconut fluffy rice is going to be amazing, vegetable. And actually there's going to be an awful lot of people eating that that's not um, necessarily thinking they need to eat meat all the time. But it's all the time, it's promoting vegan, flexitarian, as Bridget said, we've got a, a high demand out there. But also it's about increasing the number of um, portions of vegetables that eat because people will choose to rather than just be told that's what they've been told to do, that you need to have five a day. Well, that's to a certain degree, <coughs> people are going to push back against that. But actually, if they actually you have vegetables that they really want to eat, then you're halfway there. I think for um, Greg's, it was largely customer insight that we responded to, um, certainly with the balanced choice range and how that came about. And I think once we, you know, customers were coming to us and saying that they did want healthier options. So then, you know, after we launched it, I think people were then confused. We didn't really necessarily have the health credentials and all of a sudden there's, you know, salads and, well, we, you know, we, we didn't imagine going to Greg's and getting a salad. So there was a lot of brand perception work behind that. And then I think, you know, once customers got to think, well, actually, no, it, it's a salad and it might be from Greg's, but it tastes great. I think that's when, you know, the sales started to, and we did sort of start to get those health credentials and people coming to us for that rather than a, a sausage roll or, or a sandwich. Finally, just from an employer point of view, my hypothesis is that there is a huge latent demand for this amongst our people. Anecdotal evidence and talking to them would indicate that for many different reasons. And we've done some baseline research. We tend to work most of our programs off data and we'll be doing some more to find out attitude, usage and attitudes. Uh, we shouldn't underestimate behavior change because it's always difficult for humans to change behaviors and habits. Uh, but on the other hand, I would say that 
our people expect us as part of working for us to be looking out for their well-being, to be doing the right thing and to make it easy for them. We also know resoundingly that they expect us to do the right thing from an environmental point of view. They're disappointed when we don't. We track it and we can see when it trends up and down and which big programs have helped us with that. And this is one of the areas where I believe there's huge latent demand for us to do the right thing for social reasons and for environmental reasons. And it will deliver huge uh, benefit to us as a business and to society. Great, thanks, Bridget. So yeah, I mean, it, it, it's businesses that are pledging today, but it's, it's individuals that do all the hard work. So thanks sincerely for all the work you've put into uh, those commitments. Now, I'm, I'm looking for microphones disguised as broccoli. There should be two in the audience uh, that signify someone's got a question. Has anyone got anything they want to ask to the panel? I want to be a pea. <laughs> Hello, it's really interesting to hear about all the pledges that you're making to um, increase the number of portions of vegetables in your food. But what I'm interested to find out is um, what types of vegetables. I've heard a lot about two extra portions, but not all vegetables made equal. Is there any um, further study about what you'll do and what types of vegetables you'll put in to increase the nutrient density of your foods? Really good pun opportunity, guys. <laughs> <coughs> I'm going to take that for us. Yeah, yeah any, any veg that are going to yeah. do it for you? Um, well, I, I mean, I think um, a, a variety. I mean, it's the simple thing to say is, is, a, is a variety. Um, and I think there's a real opportunity to, to really push the boundaries and really sort of, uh, and they, I mean, there's some amazing stuff out there that maybe people haven't seen before. Uh, and there's a lot of, um, you know, diff different colours of vegetables, for example, whether it be uh, beetroots or tomatoes or whatever it may be, but actually that they haven't tried before and different opportunities. Um, and I think that there's, a, that, you know, we all see that in supermarkets and um, all the time that there are varieties that are available are more and more all the time. Um, and I think we have an opportunity um, to demonstrate what you can do with those. And going back to the, the education theme and actually uh, and David mentioned it about we've got some incredible chefs in our sector and a real opportunity to share knowledge and demonstrate. And, you know, um, we have some, we, I mean, I'm sure I know Sodexo do and we do as well, and master classes where our chefs will demonstrate and, and for our customers and clients. Um, so I think variety is probably the, the simplest answer. <coughs> Yeah, and, and seasonality. I mean, I think, I don't know if any, I wasn't here this morning, I don't know if anyone mentioned Brexit, but there seems to be an opportunity that we start to look more and more at what we've got seasonally and deal with it better. Uh, and, and with creativity and with bringing vegetables, in this case, into play, into uh, street food, into concepts and themes, and that you can start to kind of be more playful and be more encouraging. Um, but there, there is an opportunity in all of this as well. I think there's an opportunity, you know, development chefs are obviously very creative, but in answer to your question, I think it's equally important that we actually just try and remember to eat those everyday veg more regularly. Um, I know, you know, from a, in a sort of staff canteen perspective in the workplace environment, I am trying to encourage the teams there to really just cook more regularly with the typical veg that we'll find every day in our freezers. Um, so that's a starting point, that's a channel, um, and then the development chefs will be very creative. You know, we mentioned about our hidden veg and there's some fantastic ideas there so I think it you know it's I think it's, it's extracting those different channels and making sure you take each to the nth degree and again this is a progressive strategy we've signed up for something here that's not going to um, happen overnight we'll build on it years and years so let's pick that low-hanging vegetable uh, bush <laughs> and uh, I didn't hear a ding um, and, uh, no, and, and keep pushing forward can I, can I just Trophy. pick up on something on the, on the hidden vegetable thing I do worry that the word hidden vegetable starts to look, uh, sound like that broccoli threat earlier because actually a vegetable is an ingredient and a set of ingredients is a recipe and a recipe creates a dish. And if that, re if that recipe happens to have an ingredient that tastes delicious in that dish, whether it's hidden or not, it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be hidden. It's just a good ingredient, <laughs> I would say. <laughs> Thanks, David. Can I talk about shoes? Please. So um, I have another hypothesis, which I haven't actually shared with Mike yet, so it might come as a bit of a surprise to him, and it's not my shoe fetish. Um, I, I believe you Never wear trainers on a panel discussion. Is that what you can <laughs> no, no. Yeah. So, yeah, shoes. Um, so 
I'll explain shoes. Um, I have a view that I always feel schizophrenic about most things, but I have a view that here what we're trying to do is to be exciting about vegetables at the same time as being safe about vegetables. Because in order to get people to eat them, they need to feel fairly comfortable with what they're eating. But at the same time, we know that variety sells food. So whenever you do a recipe with a bit more of this or a new something or other, it's exciting. So why is this like shoes? When you go into a shoe shop, invariably, if you're anything like me, you'll hang your nose over the red ones and then you'll eventually end up buying the black ones, right? So I think what we have to do is introduce new ingredients that people don't necessarily know about to pep it up and to make it look exciting and then allow them to fall back on more familiar vegetables which they're comfortable with having been engaged and excited about some of these new flavors types of vegetables etc so i i think we're going to try and test it out and see what happens great thanks mm -hmm. richard is that all right um, mike absolutely <laughs> i can see broccoli Please now yes um, great to hear the pledges, pledges, pledges today on Out of Home, but one question, just moving a bit more towards family dining or, or the fine dining, uh, one of the things that really annoys me is the cost of the vegetables. They're often separate. Um, I'd often like to eat two, but actually even I sort of sometimes balk at the price. Is there any work that's being done to try and encourage it more in that end as well? Uh, because that hasn't really been mentioned. Mm. I mean, I could certainly kick us off. Mm. I, I, I guess, um, yes, so one of the pledges that we work with the Food Foundation on <coughs> does have a at no extra cost uh, part of it, which deals with exactly that uh, challenge. I, I guess what we're seeing on the fine dining side is um, a, a lot more work from chefs to put veg at the centre of the plates. I don't know, this has kind of come up a few times today, but there's a, there's a great resource called Plant Forward 50 uh, that has 50 global chefs that, I guess, start with a vegetable in the middle and then they might add meat to that or or not uh, but you're not going to be sort of having sort of five six pounds just to put a bit more color on your plate so i'd say uh, at the mainstream one of the key pledges that we're all here talking about today has that sort of cost locked in and at, at, the, <coughs> at the upper end or fine dining end it's kind of pretty trendy and we're seeing quite a lot of movement around um, kind of veg not being a side and maybe make, making meat a side Yeah, I think for us as well, it's, it's, it's not so much the high street side of it. So it tends mm -hmm. to be hospitality and dining, and that's a different mm -hmm. price yeah. model, so slightly different. And it's includes annoying to be charged a five of a burnt broccoli, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I suppose in the workplace, an equivalent is um, the client hospitality. So if we have client in meetings and events, we may often serve food alongside that if they're working lunches, etc. And we're already looking at the menus that we offer for that so that vegetables become more of a default offering, uh, so that there's more mm. of them included in it. It's not just what we serve in the restaurants to our employees. We're looking at the whole across the range suite of, of food that we offer to our people and to our clients. Great, thanks. Um, yeah, please. Yeah, um, I've just got a question about quality. This actually goes across not just this panel, but actually all of them today and follows on quite nicely from the question about um, variety as well. Um, and I don't think all vegetables are produced equally either. Um, and we know that there are, you know, there's sort of good quality food and bad quality food. And I'm, um, I think it's really important that we have this message that you know, eating more veg is really good. But I feel there's also a bit of danger about simplifying it and just saying any old veg will do. Um, and there's a sort of growing body of evidence about a, a nutrient collapse because of the way that we're producing vegetables as well. So just wondered if there's any comments on that. Uh, from a frozen supply chain perspective, clearly, you know, IQF, individually quick frozen products, um, peas mentioned earlier, actually, um, frozen within a few hours of picking, you know, you retain that freshness and lock in the nutrients. From a frozen perspective, uh, you know, you get great quality and you get great nutrient value. Um, obviously, fresh produce, when it is fresh, does deteriorate throughout the supply chain, and sometimes these supply chains can be long and complex. And I'll mention the B word again, being if we can grow more homegrown veg, then we've got an opportunity to reduce um, those supply chains um, and try and iron out some of those seasonality issues, capturing some of the sort of techniques our colleagues from um, Holland and Netherlands here today have utilised so, so well over the last decade or two in 
extending those seasons. So there are opportunities now more than ever to actually improve the quality within the UK of the products that we grow if we're going to reduce those supply chains. But equally, frozen really gives you an opportunity to overcome some of those challenges. For us as um, the healthy food company, um, we have three factories across the country um, which supply sort of certain areas within and we source local produce vegetables um, for our dishes the same as we do with our meat um, to support you know the local farmers. Yeah, and yeah. I, I guess from, from certainly from our point of view that we work we have a, a supply chain structure and we work very hard with our suppliers to make sure that we don't have uh, you know poor quality or, or you know under under minimum standard quality coming in ever but at the same time because we're trying to be more exciting more seasonal etc you know I think there's a supply and demand thing that comes into that that should help uh, and it's up to us to just keep pushing that all the time so from a chef point of view uh, I'd like to think that we work hard to get to eradicate that yeah, I think it is a, a really good question, a really valid point. Uh, what we see is that when more uh, eating out establishments kind of build their dishes around veg, uh, that forces a sort of up, upward uh, sort of barrier on the, the sort of quality provenance. It, it pushes mm -hmm. us towards a, a certain sort of type uh, as opposed to it being a sort of commodified portion. Uh, but yeah, I, th I think that's, that's an interesting thing. It probably plays quite differently in different contexts in the industry. Um, I'm not sure who's next. But. Sure. Thank you. Um, Dan Kelly, Director of Food at Vacheren. Um, about five years ago, we started to make a change to all of our menus, uh, introducing more fruit and vegetables into them. Um, one of the things that does worry me massively is cost, um, as was touched on by Kathleen earlier. Um, also, the sustainability. Someone said earlier about, you know, there was going to be a lot less land available for growing this. I think it's true at the moment that 43% of vegetables and fruit don't make it for uh, human consumption. Um, there is a pledge that we would like to make, um, and I guess this is out to David and to Mike there as well, um, and hopefully they'll come along with us on that, and that is for us to actually stop competing and maybe try working together to make a difference <laughs> on this. Um, we all try to be the one that stands out, but actually if we work together, we actually are quite a huge part of the industry uh, and a huge industry in itself. Um, so I'm asking, actually, <laughs> will you two guys make the pledge to work with us and actually look at changing our procurement strategies? Uh, at Vacheren, we have done that, um, but actually looking at the other companies as well to come together as a, as a one to make a big difference going forward. That I'm going to actually just, just interrupt you and save the chaps a little bit here. How would you integrate supply chains from different companies to try and reduce its food waste in particular, are you, are you suggesting? Uh, I'm just trying to sort of understand how, on what levels that could be possible, unless you're just trying to improve your purchasing power, <laughs> or trying to you know, leverage more, or is it actually trying to reduce food waste because you know it's inherent in the supply chain already? And then what synergies would you have with separate supply chains for different businesses based on different locations throughout the UK? Um, I'm not trying to be negative. I'm just trying to give the chaps a bit of a chance here um, <laughs> because otherwise it would feel or probably sound as though that's, um, yeah, uh, it's, 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 it's unworkable. I'm just concerned that... No, no, absolutely. Uh, um, you can have a chat about it. I'm just thinking, you know, how... We're restricted to one pledge. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Is there any brief comments Sorry if that appears negative. Because of the collaboration you'd like to see? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there was many obstacles for us at the beginning when we started to make the changes. One of the things was that we found out, obviously, the, the control and the power of the bigger companies, not necessarily yourselves, I'm talking about supermarkets, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Um, and a lot of the produce that doesn't get utilised. Um, there's a lot of it out there, a hell of a lot. I was very lucky to do a programme um, on one of the national channels, uh, working with a few of the Michelin star chefs, and the amount of farmers that were going out of business um, because of this. Obstacles were put in the way with a lot of people saying, yeah, it just can't be done, purely because it hadn't been done in the past. Um, a lot of the problems, as Andrew knows, because we've worked with the SRA quite a lot, um, we struggle because of our size to get this produce and actually utilise it. We've used a hell of a lot, um, but we do feel that if we are able to use this other 43% that goes elsewhere, it will one, bring the pricing down, 
to educate people that there is a lot more out there that can be done with fruit and vegetables. Oh, sorry, I'm throwing fruit in there as well. Um, but with us coming together, if we could stockpile, get it all together in one place and get our suppliers, put pressure on our suppliers to actually utilise it as well, then I, I think it could make a huge difference. And there's a whole lot of education in there. We were talking about education. It isn't just about schools. It's about every single level. Um, you know, supermarkets have educated people in the past to think that a carrot is straight. Well, I'm sorry, it's not. Anywhere you go, you know, no one's grown a great, uh, straight carrot for many years. They, they've, they've done that on purpose. And there's nothing wrong with a wonky carrot. And I think Kathleen talked about wonky fruit and veg earlier, about the price difference in that. I think it, it, we have to look at it. It's great that we're going to use a lot of vegetables, but it's got to be sustainable. By 2050, I believe there won't be any more land to be able to grow the fruit and vegetables on. So we need to do something. We need to utilise it all. Thanks, Dan. I, I think it's and, um, maybe important. Yeah, perfect. Um, we have a farmer down the front looking for a bit of broccoli. Thanks. <laughs> Can I just say, as a farmer, um, there's a lot of things were said there that um, I'd like to uh, talk about. I think one of the problems in this whole supply chain is actually the demise of the wholesale market. Because the wholesale market was where people came, uh, organisations and food service organisations came to buy their produce. And the prices would move with the availability. And the problem now is that the whole supply chain wants fixed contract prices through the year. And they don't like to have the variability. But crops don't grow like that. You know, sometimes there's abundance. Sometimes there's a, a shortage, there's a flush or whatever. And the wholesale market was a way of actually clearing that abundance and that flush. And there was very, very good value available if you went and shopped around in the wholesale market situation to actually buy the bargains and then change the menus. The, all the flexibility has gone out of it now. So as growers, we're expected to always deliver a fixed amount of produce at a fixed price. And it's impossible to do. And that's actually where most of the waste comes from. It's the inflexibility in the way the produce is used after the farm. And I think that the, that is a big problem. And in Europe, we've, we trade all over Europe. We supply produce into the whole of Europe. The whole market is much more flexible in the rest of Europe. And I think in the USA as well, our experience there is the market situation still reigns and, and dominates the situation, whereas in this country, we've got an artificial market, and that's where the, a lot of the waste comes from. I, I do think, I, I'll take your point, but, on, but there, is a, it is a, there is a huge um, spread of businesses out there in the market from the organisations that want the wholesale want a, a set contract price for a huge volume at certain times of the year. But there's also an awful lot of businesses out there that have that degree of flexibility and don't buy like that. And they buy locally and they buy seasonally from a, a, a mixture of different suppliers. I mean, I was just talking to Bridget earlier. Um, we'll use uh, 10, have opportunity to use 10 different suppliers for fruit and vegetables around, around PwC in London. Now that gives us huge opportunity to shop around. They will be shopping around themselves to find what produce they have, which means they can give us better deals and um, discounts and whatever, however it works individually. But we have a huge amount of flexibility. And I think there's an awful lot of restaurants out there and um, pubs, apart from possibly the big chains, um, where they still have that degree of flexibility. So I think there is still um, the wholesale market out there. And I think it's, um, with all due respect, I think it's... It, it's uh, disingenuous to su suggest that they have gone and it's all very standardised and very uh, manufactured. It's not necessarily that way. But thanks for the point. Certainly a, a, a really good thing to reflect on, sort of the opportunity that comes from some of those seasonality and gluts and uh, is that the veg that we should be talking about putting onto the menu. Um, any other questions for our panel? Um, yes, you can patient at the top there. Yes, uh, Theresa Wickham, um, can I, I just support what John said, but can I just remind you, we're still lucky in London to have a fruit and vegetable market, which we're rebuilding at the moment down at um, 
Battersea Nine Elms, which supplies 60% of the restaurants in London. And the variety and the choice there is just amazing. Uh, my comment, actually, and my um, point was, I'm really interested in what you're doing with PwC and, and Baxter's. If you are providing the recipes for your staff uh, when they have a really nice vegetarian meal, is there any chance you can go one bit further and provide the box of the ingredients all ready for them to take home to make so that their family then start to get educated on that? I mean, they obviously don't want the same meal they've had that day, but it used to fail, these box kits, but these box kits are now beginning to mm. emerge again. Mm. And it just wondered to me if it would be a great idea to, to trial there and see if it worked. I mean, after all, when you've been at work all day, you don't want to go shopping, you go online. But if you could get them at the same time, it would be amazing. I think, th thank you very much. Um, and yeah, that is a great idea. Um, I think we, I mean, we, have, we haven't necessarily tried it at PwC um, yet, but we have tried it in, in other elements of our business. Um, it is very um, location-based, and it's, th these things tend to be um, uh, dependent on how someone travels to work, which sound, might sound a bit odd. But if they um, get on the train, they walk to the station, get on the train, they may not be able to. And it's also a question of, depending on what the ingredients are, um, the amount of packaging that would be required, how they're going to transport it, is it temperature controlled, and how long it's going to take. So it is a great idea, and it's appropriate in certain places. Um, and I think it would be, we'll, we'll certainly, um, I'll talk to Bridget about giving that, having that opportunity at PwC going forward. Pam. So actually, one, it's a good thing for us to put in the pot because we mentioned the recipes and the, the promotion that we're going to do all around the business. In fact, it's happening now. So there's communications all through the offices, driving people in, encouraging them to go and have team meals and try our lovely pumpkin and nut curry. Um, that's really just to demonstrate, build awareness and to demonstrate that it's all tasty food, right, the vegetable bits. But actually what we've talked about is a whole load of other changes to the restaurant, uh, introducing and trialling um, dedicated, explicit vegan and vegetarian offerings. We're intending to take the food out of the restaurant and onto the practice floors because it will help with the queuing and the time that people need in order to get there uh, at lunchtime when we've got a lot of people trying to feed at the same time. So we're going to take it out and that will have a preponderance of fresh fruit and veg in it as well. Um, we've talked about a pop-up stand, which will have plant-based protein, introducing people to that over time so they get familiar with how they get the protein that they want, which many people associate to only be able to get from meat-based products, for example. Um, and we're having these seasonal um, hero campaigns, which will build over time a number of different vegetable um, recipes. So we've got a pot of things that we want to try. We will measure every month, and we're going to review it every quarter to see how successful we are and whether we're on track. We'll keep those that work, and then we'll introduce new ones as we go through. So we can definitely add that into the Absolutely. pot. And if other people have suggestions, we're all ears. Great. Thank you, Bridget. So um, I've just got a few more minutes left. I'll, I'll, I'd suggest if we could just take any final questions, maybe just do two at a time, and then give the panel a chance for like, final comments and thoughts. Any remaining bits of broccoli? No, we've overcooked it. Oh, there's one there, yeah. Oh. Next to the chilli. <laughs> Hi, yeah. Uh, Kona Hawke, Centre for Food Policy. I have a question about the commitments that you've just made. Excellent to see these commitments. Excellent to see the specificity in the commitments. Uh, one might suggest that they could be more ambitious. Of course, the danger of being too ambitious is if you don't take your, your customers with you, you don't take your, your, your people with you, and, and then you just get failure. Um, but one could also argue that commitments should be made to be more ambitious in order to really kind of push you a bit harder um, and that there could be policy frameworks in place to enable that to happen. And you do hear in other areas um, that sometimes industry says, you know, level playing field can help. Uh, what's your view about uh, what might help you uh, push you further uh, beyond just the desires and, and, and differences that are emerging in your customer and, and consumer base. Thanks, Karina. So while you're in the pressure cooker there, guys, is there any final question? And we'll just take both those together. No, I can't see any hands. Good. OK. Um, so what, what could help us be even more ambitious or, or what might help us go even further? I think m momentum, I, I think, is an important piece, really. Uh, we know this is a four-year plan. Um, you know, we've been, we feel, we've been quite ambitious, actually, in uh, what we're trying to do here. Um, 
So I think as we gain momentum, we'll become more and more ambitious as awareness create, uh, it grows and we create that headspace. We get more people within the business to adopt these new strategies. Hopefully we can come back next year and say, actually, we've smashed these targets, which are ambitious targets, I have to be honest. Um, but I'd like to think that momentum will gain and, 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 and hopefully in time we can be more ambitious. We all don't like to fail. Um, we've all sort of come forward and sat here today and spoke about what we are going to do. And, uh, uh, and, and uh, it's great to see Greg uh, here, uh, you know, making these ambitions and targets. And I think it's great and admirable. So I think, from my perspective, momentum uh, will help. Um, my work. And I think it's not just ambition; it's also passion. It's about the passion of making a change. And I think when you've got that passion, you actually don't give up until you achieve it. I would agree with Dave as well. I mean, I think it's it's about the momentum. We're we're, we're starting to do something that, you know, we're not starting from today, there's lots of things in, in motion already, but this starts to focus and, and focus the mind a little bit more. So if we can break those, um, you know, go through the ceiling with these pledges and, and, and maybe in hindsight go, you know, we could have been more ambitious, but actually 10% of, your, your, of, of, a, of a, a, a volume in the current climate with inflation, with decreasing uses of vegetables, etc is in itself a challenge, so we're going to push that as hard as we can to, to achieve it at least. Great. Thanks, everyone. I, I, I think there's some, you know, some real operational hard yards to be, to be uh, won in achieving these commitments. I think from an SRA point of view, one of the things that we think uh, is, is a great, uh, I don't know, I guess sort of recipe for the more ambitious is to just emphatically share more about some of the tactics and some of the hows. Uh, down in the detail about how you've brought staff with you, be it front of house, back of house. Uh, that's not an area where we need to kind of waste energy as an industry. And um, we think the more ambitious businesses will be hitting their targets, but really helping others do it too, because we shouldn't be competing on this stuff. But um, just join me in thanking the panel for their energy and time today. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>